Here's a question. Capitalism or socialism? That's what Hao Jingfang's Vagabonds is asking its readers. Or is it? Is there actually a lot more going on in this book? Here to help me explore just about every question the book asks, and there is absolutely a multitude, is Ken Leo. He's the guest for this episode. And if you haven't heard of him, he is pretty much the premier translator of Chinese sci-fi, at least from Chinese into English. And that's not actually even his main line of work. He's also a novelist, and we'll be hearing lots about that from him, as well as even, even more about his translation and his work on Vagabonds and other works of Chinese sci-fi. I won't even try and list all the things we're going to talk about. We had a very long and very fruitful and just excellent chat. It's a very, very fun episode to record this time around. So, before we get to all that, it's time for the Trucha Fig News, a little news segment where we go through maybe not necessarily what's new in translated Chinese fiction, because I wouldn't claim to know everything, but things that have caught my eye. Let's start with the first thing, which is actually about the book Vagabonds. Now, Ken's English translation of Vagabonds is going to be coming out on the 14th of April this year. That's uh, through Simon & Schuster in the US and Head of Zeus in the Commonwealth. It's the English translation. Ken Liu also provided for me the uh, Chinese publication dates, obviously the original uh, Chinese language version. Uh, this is something that came up in our interview, but which he couldn't immediately recall to mind, and I did not know. I should have checked before the show was researched, but um, as, I'm, as you'll hear me mention in the show, I'm sometimes a little bit lazy with research, especially when I know I've got a guest coming on. The info for the publication of Vagabonds in uh, the original Chinese edition is thus. It was published in two separate volumes, uh, the first in 2011, the second in 2012, and a combined like single volume edition came out a whole four years later. And Ken's actually confirmed with uh, Hao Jingfang that she finished the, like, the manuscript for this book, the unpublished version, in 2009, back when she was only 25. Um, I just turned um, 27, it was the day before I interviewed Ken, and two days ago, so as you can probably work out, I'm recording this a day after my interview. So yeah, I just turned 27 basically, and god damn it, I'm certainly not a Hao Jingfang. So clearly, she is a smart, sharp, and motivated person, and you're going to hear even more about why that's the case in my interview. Ken um, told me some amazing things about Hao Jingfang and the awesome stuff she does. So that's our first Church of Fake News entry. I'm just bringing up the second one now. Yes, now this is about Second Sister, a new book that is coming out. I'm also going to share some release info. Now this is a new book by the Hong Kong writer uh, Chan Ho Ke. This came out, as far as I can tell, published by Grove Atlantic in the US and Head of Zeus uh, in the UK and I guess perhaps the Commonwealth, I'm not entirely sure. I know that Head of Zeus had taken on a previous one of uh, Chan Ho Ke's books, The Borrowed. Oh yeah, I guess Grove Atlantic published The Borrowed because I'm on their website and I can see that they're referencing it and quotes to it. But yeah, I, I've got a review copy of the Head of Zeus edition, which I'm reading in preparation for a reviewer's meeting, conference, workshop um, later in the month. Editor's note. So since I recorded this intro, some news has arisen. This review um, conference or meeting or whatever that I mentioned has been cancelled because of coronavirus and so has the London Book Fair, which I was also going to be attending. Um, I think I might have mentioned these two things in past episodes, possibly. But yeah, um, just an, a thing that kind of marks where the show has been released in the march of history. Coronavirus has disrupted um, translated Chinese fiction, or, or at least the people involved in it. And indeed, of course, in the case of the London Book Fair, it's disrupted publishing, uh, world and UK publishing significantly. So just an interesting wee note. Now let's get back to the true fake news. And yeah, it's, it's a really good book. I've really been enjoying reading it. What else can I say? It's fast-paced, it's exciting, and it's basically about cyberbullying. 
and the internet and hacking and it's just fantastic and I've not really read have I read any other Hong Kong stories apart from this? Perhaps, but nothing in translation, I don't think. So it's um it's an interesting, similar but not the same kind of a uh, context of story for me to be reading. So yeah, um that is on the way, and the translator of that book I should mention is Jeremy Tiang, who I've mentioned many, many times on the show. Clearly because he's a good and interesting translator. So that is our second piece of Trishofic news. And the third, um, this one I don't have any particularly substantive uh, information or dates to share, but this is an interesting thing, and it does come up in my interview with Ken Leo, so I thought I would just lay it out now. Um, I may have mentioned this in my previous episode on Neil Tsushin's um, Devourer with my guest Adam McMurchy, because he is a fan of this thing, and this thing is, it's a thing called My Three Body, and it is a, let's just say a YouTube adaptation of the three body problem but the twist here is that it was made in minecraft it is a minecraft version of leo tzushin's three body problem uh, trilogy of books and given the kind of failures and hurdles of uh, three body to come out like for the official film adaptation to come out or for a tv series to come out or even an animated series that is still in the works and yet uh, fans have made a Minecraft version. As far as I'm aware, uh, it's in Chinese with English subs. As you can tell, I haven't watched it yet. That is on my to-do list, and I will I will watch at least one episode. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have any particular links, but all you have to do, just type in a three-body Minecraft or my three-body Minecraft into Google or your internet search or YouTube, and you'll get it. It's all up there for free. And if you watch it um, and you want to tell me what it's like, um, you can use the social media links I provide at the end of the show get in touch. I'd love to hear about what you think of my three body, although I, I, I phrased that a strange way, didn't I? That's all the Trishofic news. Let's charge on and hear the fantastic chat I had with Ken Leo, an absolutely amazing guest. Let, let's get to that. So I'm on the show with Ken Leo. He's the undisputed Buddha of translated Chinese sci-fi. You've probably heard of him if you've been listening. Ken, can you tell us a wee bit about yourself and what you do before I start questioning you? Sure. Uh, thank you, Angus, for having me on the show. And um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be on the show um, talking about how to find new novel with everyone. Um, so briefly about me, I am an author uh, and I'm probably most well known for two things. One is my epic Silk Punk um, epic fantasy novel series called The Dandelion Dynasty that starts with The Grace of Kings. Uh, and the other is uh, a short story I wrote called The Paper Menagerie, which is the lead story in my short story collection, The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories. Um, that particular story won a bunch of awards and was widely anthologized and reprinted. Um, and so uh, chances are uh, most people know me uh, from that line of work, which is my main job. Um, I also um, do uh, translations um, as a, not as a profession, but um, as a way to help out some friends mm. um, that I've gotten to know over the years. Um, it, it started basically because I uh, got to know a lot of writers from China and I really admired their work. And at the time that um, I first got to know their work, there were very few English translations of their uh, stories available. Uh, and I knew nothing about translation, but I thought I wanted to help out you know, my friends as much as possible. So I got into it to help them first edit their translations, uh, and then later I was just doing them myself. Um, and then uh, over the years, uh, I've gotten to do uh, a few more of these for different uh, friends. Uh, and I have two anthologies out, um, Invisible Planets and Broken Stars, which collect some of the stories I've translated. Uh, mm. And of course, I also translated The Three Body Problem by Liu Cixin, um, one of um, China's most famous sci-fi novels. Um, but <clears throat> the translation part is, is not my job. And it, it's really something I do uh, just as a favor for different friends. And so I think um, unlike, some, uh, unlike some translators I've talked to, I, I don't focus as much on um, the pure... Um, textual aspect of translation. I'm much more interested in um, authorial intent and trying to help uh, the author um, tell the story in a different language. Um, so mm. that's 
pretty much um, I think the background that listeners need to know about me. That's that's awesome. If anyone's tuning in, I say tuning in, if anyone has sought out this episode because you guys are Ken Leo fans and you haven't listened to this show before, we did do a like a quote unquote sci-fi season, a string of episodes all about Chinese sci-fi. And quite a lot of those stories, I'm sure the vast majority of them were translated by yourself, Ken. And we had Leo Tsushin in there and we had Hao Jin Fang's maybe the work she's most famous for, uh, Folding Beijing in there. So that's that's something for the listeners to, or new listeners to go seek out if you guys enjoy translated Chinese sci-fi by Ken and indeed, well, translated by Ken or indeed translated by anyone and written by anyone. We, we definitely covered a few stories or at least one or two which were from Broken Stars and Invisible Planets, which if you guys awesome. haven't read them are really great collections. Fantastic. Um, before I just go on and on and on about how great the stories are, um, there's a thing we do every episode, or at least if I remember, because I've slipped up and forgotten it a few times. We do like a word of the day <laughs> where I try and think of a, a Mandarin word that applies strongly to or captures the essence of the story. But I think for Hao Jing Fan's uh, Vagabonds, there's an awful lot of keywords that you could latch on to that could capture the essence of the story because it's quite a multi-layered story so instead i'll i'll go to a real expert um ken could you give us a word of the day this time i'm actually going to um give you a word of the day that is the same in english as it is in chinese uh and it's an invented word by how to found herself it's ma earth um, which is a combination of Mars and Earth. It is the name of the spaceship that shuttles between the two planets. Um, and I think it actually um, represents in so many ways, just by its nature, um, the the key themes of this particular novel. Mm. When I was reading, so I read the English, um, well, your translation, Ken, I didn't read the Chinese. So on the page, I guess it was M-A-E-A-R-T-H. I was That's reading right. Marth, maybe Maybe I should have been reading it Ma Earth. Um, in the Chinese edition, which characters spell Ma Earth? Uh, they use Ma or Si, um, and uh, it's uh, it, it, it literally is uh, is a transliteration of English. Right, and is right. So it's a transliteration of Mars, but it also sounds a bit like Earth. Is that the idea? That is the idea. It's a combination of the two. And it's right. not based on Chinese names for the planets, but rather mm. in English. Yeah, the Chinese names of the planets might pop up later in our episode. Um, so later on, I'm going to be asking Ken about um, Hao Jingfang and her work and Vagabonds, the story itself, and about Chinese sci-fi and translation and some further reading kind of stories related to this one, one way or the other. Uh, but right now, we're going to start with publishing related questions. Because it's always good to like eat your greens before your ice cream. And also, <laughs> I've got a master's in publishing, and this stuff is not necessarily a green for me, even if it is for you listeners. Because <laughs> selfishness is a great, great motivator for me. I so, love this page. <laughs> works for me. Um, so, first question, Ken. Uh, there's a bit of a pattern within English language publication of Chinese sci-fi. I think I think you'd agree with me. Um, most of the books. Are translated by yourself then they're published in i think I, I think it's north america not just the us i could be wrong uh, by tor and then the rest of the world by head of zeus this is at least for the english translations um head of zeus being a uk company based in london but there are some exceptions to the pattern there's um joel martinson's leo Tzushin, uh, translations which are Tor slash Head of Zeus, but obviously have a different translator. The Wandering Earth also applies to an extent because it's got the same publishers, but a lot of the different short stories within are by different translators, yourself included. And then there's some others like The Reincarnated Giant, which is, I forget if that's Columbia, Uni Columbia University Press or Chinese University Press. They're both CUP and I get them mixed up. And there's Pathological, which is by Wang Jingkan, translated by Jeremy Tiang, and that's an Amazon Crossing book. Um, so how does Vagabonds fit in here? How much of a, how much does it follow that pattern? How much is it different from a publishing perspective? So um, since we are talking solely about publishing, I'm going to start out by saying that um, I'm not a publisher and my no. knowledge of the publishing industry is solely from the author side of it. Mm. So it's necessarily very limited and skewed and biased and all of that. So, so 
you know, take everything I say with huge grains of salt and so on and so forth. I always try to remind listeners I'm also not an expert, just an interested person. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. We're we're all sort of able to see just a very narrow slice of of the whole picture. Um, So from my perspective, the pattern you've identified is factually true, but it's also somewhat misleading in the Mm. sense that um, I have much less influence and, and my role is much smaller than people might think uh, based on the fact that my name um, appears on the books under the authors. Um, yes, my name is on there, but but I'm hardly the main player in many of these things. Um, when it comes to things like short fiction, like um, Invisible Planets or Broken Stars, um, it's true. Um, most of those projects were initiated by me because I was interested in trying to find uh, markets and, and get the work of my friends um, outside of China and, and give them a global audience because translation into English is very critical, not just for the North America and the UK market or you know the rest of the Anglophone world. Rather, translation into English is the gateway to the rest of the world period. Um, editors in Germany, Spain, Japan, Korea, etc., may not be able to read Chinese books, but they m- almost all of them can read English books um, because of the way today's world is organized. English is the language that all educated individuals are expected to be able to read. Um, right. So uh, once you have an English translation of a Chinese book, um, now you have the potential to make Russian deals and Japanese deals and Turkish deals and so on and so forth. Um, whereas if your book you know, isn't translating to English first, then you don't really have the opportunity to do any of that. So um, I, this is not a claim for the awesomeness of English or anything like that. It, it just is a fact of the publishing yeah. industry, for good or ill. That's the way, that's the world we live in. Now, as far as um, the big novels like uh, Lizzie James novels are concerned. Um, Joel and I are colleagues and we basically play the same role. Um, we were not the ones to arrange these translation deals. Uh, CPEC, C-E-P-I-E-C, which is the acronym for a completely um, uh, unpronounceable long name for a state publisher in China. That should, should have got that on paper as preparation for the show. Yeah, it, I, I can actually tell you what it is. I, I, I'm hoping I'll get this right, but I, I, I never can. So let me try to do it from memory. It, it's China Education Import Export uh, C-E-P-I-E Import Export um, Company? Company, yes. So, exactly. So anyway, Perfect. it's a state Well done, um, Publisher, well, that does. Um, so, if you're listening out there, Kelly, this is just not me not being able to remember. Um, so, the the company, um, and in fact, uh, two of the executives there were the ones who were particularly uh, relevant for this story. They were the ones who first identified the possibility of bringing the books to the English market. And then they were the ones who approached me and Joel and got us to, to do the translation. Um, and uh, and then, of course, tour books uh, with Liz Gorinsky as the editor and Lindsay Hall now taking over uh, for her. They were the ones who uh, really helped edit the books and, and provided incredible advice along the way and figure out the marketing plan and so on and so forth and got the books out. Um, so, you know, the role I play uh, for something like that is, is very small. I, I did the translation and my work was entirely focused on just creating the publishing aspect of it, how to make it work, how to make it, how to position in the market, how to actually publicize it so that people would know about it and folks who are interested in it would find out about it. That That's, you know, not something that I was able to help a lot with. And I really do believe right. that all books have an audience and need to actually find that audience. And that's, that's the hardest part of publishing. Um, and it's almost magic. Uh, a lot of times a book that will just not work for a reader will, will be the perfect book for a different reader. But, but how do you Mm-hmm. connect that reader with the book that's the hardest part right and what i find right. to be amazing is is um this is Jean's books and now chen chu fan's book and and hopefully has a book will be able to find the right readers um and and mm-hmm. based on early um buzz it, it feels like they are going to find the right readers and that makes me so happy because it's just so difficult and so rare and so magical um you know when you manage to connect 
the right book with the readers who are perfect for it. Um, and, and it really is wonderful for that to happen. And then I think um, Simon Schuster, um, which is the publisher for Vagabonds this time, um, they're also actually my publisher and the editor is is my editor for my own books. So um, the fact that uh, Vagabonds is being brought out and the publicity uh, manager is, in fact, the same person who also uh, works on my books. Um, hi, oh. okay. Um, so cool. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to, to sort of um, see um, uh, this book being positioned um, and, and being shown uh, and exposed uh, and talked about uh, by folks who I think are um, able to appreciate what it is and what it does. Mm-hmm. And am I right in thinking that? Oh, sorry, a sparrowhawk just flew past my window. I wonder hey, what's up. Hey, nice. Yeah, it's a good uh, omen. I think. I, yeah, I'm going to tell myself it is. Am I right in thinking that outside of North America, Vagabonds is a uh, head of Zeus book? Are they still involved? That's as right. Well? That's right. Head of Zeus also has done amazing work. Um, I haven't mentioned them as much simply because I work much more closely with the U.S. publishers, but um, mm. I, I really should do a better job of. Um, Reminding folks that outside of North America, Head of Zeus, um, you know, which has, which has done just incredible work in bringing out all these translated novels as well as the collections uh, to the Commonwealth uh, territories, um, and mm. they do a great job of putting out special editions, uh, signed editions, and um, my favorite um, part of touring as an author is when I was in the UK um, because Head of Zeus just does such an amazing job of arranging great events and um, my publicist was uh, just an awesome individual um, and, and gave me um, so much help and so when I'm touring uh, either to promote the translations or my own books I, I love visiting the UK just a uh, cool place to be. That's cool um, as a Scottish person I want to ask how what's the furthest north that they sent you? Oh, I'm sorry. I never got into Scotland. So uh, right. I think in London for only a few days. So almost everything was in London. But oh, okay. uh, I'm planning on doing a personal trip to the UK and I'm hoping to actually hit Scotland this time. So <laughs> that's the if, that's the If you're coming in summer, you could try and catch the Edinburgh uh, Fringe or the Edinburgh Literature Festival. Are you, is it summertime or is it another time? It's probably going to be fall. I was um, okay. I was actually invited to um, to the festival, but it just conflicted with other things. Yeah. So I missed yeah. my chance last time to uh, to go visit. Yeah, I'll share a really quick anecdote here. So when I last year when I was doing my master's in uh, Edinburgh, after the previous year I'd been in China, far away from um, a lot of these offer uh, English language offer tours. Uh, Marcus Zusak, who wrote one of my favorite books ever, I Am the Messenger, was he was on his world tour promoting. Uh, Bridge of Clay and he's he'd come to the UK and just like it is with a lot of bands wasn't coming any further north than Manchester but Manchester is where I used to live so I thought what the hell I'll go back and I'll catch him and it so turned out he was asking everyone where they'd come from because he does a thing the person who's traveled furthest he like gives them he takes their address and then he mails them stuff so I told him he'd come from Scotland because this was the furthest north he was coming and then later the year they I think his publishers made him do maybe even two more world tours because he was back in the UK twice and was in Scotland both times. So I've realized that maybe not meaning to attribute too much power to myself, but it's always helpful to ask the offers to come closer to you. I, yeah, that, I like that. I like yeah. that. <laughs> not related to Chinese sci-fi at all, but I think it's a good anecdote. And if yes, you ever see Marcus right. Zuzak at an event, just tell him you've come from really far away and uh, you might be the winner of whatever yeah, prize Make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, second publishing question. Uh, this one's about the covers, the aesthetics, because I've seen a couple different covers and also titles. I think I've seen the titles uh, Stray Skies, Vagabond, uh, singular, and Vagabonds, plural, that being the one that I guess was settled on. So you've already kind of stressed that you are not the absolute overseer of, of all things. You're just one person. But did you have any input? regarding the, the title or the cover? So Simon Schuster does a great job, um, as does Tor, of involving um, the authors, and, and in this case, uh, me as translator, in um, designing the, the books and covers and, and so on. Um, so when, when Simon Schuster does my own books, uh, like The Paper Menagerie um, or The Grace of Kings or my new collection, The Hidden Girl and other stories, um, I, I do have a lot of input into the cover. Um, this case is a little different. 
I felt that in this case, um, I, I really wanted to sort of pull back a little bit um, and um, allow uh, the publisher and the author to really figure out what how they wanted to position the book. Because my personal feeling was that the book was complicated to position. And I had some thoughts mm. which I share with the author, uh, author and, and with the publisher. But other than that, I said I wanted to step back. And, and not actually be very involved in the design and cover for this book because it's not vagabond vagabonds uh, is not as easy to classify um, the way something like the three body problem is three body problem is very clearly a hard sci-fi book vagabond yeah. is very different uh, and I, I'm I'm doubtful that um, some folks who are very uh, I mean, I'm not one of them. I, I don't actually care about genre boundaries at all. Uh, but that's because I'm an author. I'm not a publisher. So I don't I don't have to worry about positioning the book in the right niche for the market. Mm -hmm. um, but but I know that there are folks who are super sensitive about genre boundaries may even question whether Vagabond counts as sci-fi or not. Um, so right. I, I wanted to step back. And then and I, I'm really pleased with the solution they came up with, which I understand uh, Tifan really enjoyed and liked as well. Uh, the, the cover they, they ended up doing which I think uh, suggests a much more literary, uh, quote unquote, approach to the book. Yeah. Um, and as far as the titles go, Stray Skies was the original, quote unquote, uh, English title. Uh, often books in China have an English title. Uh, and I did not like that title because I felt that it wasn't very clear in terms of what it was trying to say. Um, mm -hmm. And I took the original um uh, Chinese title and sort of ripped on it, which is something like Wanderer um, in the Sky, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? I think um, the idea here is vagabond. It's, it's really about um, everything about the word, the romance it evokes and the harshness of the reality of the vagabond life. Uh, all of it brought up the right association uh, for me. And my original suggestion was to use the singular uh, because I wanted to focus on Lo Yin, the main character. Um, but later on, during the production process, my editor pointed out that it, it actually, it, it, Lo Yin is not the only person who um, deals with the condition of being a vagabond, of, of feeling torn between homelands. And, yeah. and I, I agreed with him. And so um, after discussion with the author, we went with the plural. Um, you know, I'm still not totally used to it because in my mind, during most of the production of the book, I was going with the singular. But now that it's settled on as the plural, um, sometimes I'm, I'm still not used to it. But I do think it's the right choice. Yeah. Um, without spilling any beans about uh, the publisher I've been helping out, they, they of course, have the same thing. They have a uh, a first working title and then the fact that the title that they actually publish but the the file structure of all the just the things on the hard drive that we're all moving around doesn't really do to be changing file names too much so you'll be getting a book ready for publication with the full polished name but in your instant messaging chat you're still using uh, an acronym be it ab or df or whatever which has got which is an acronym of the original working title but looks nothing like the one that's come out so i can i can understand if your brain still hasn't quite added the s onto vagabonds uh, oh yeah i i know well of what you speak i mean all my files on my hard drive are singular so it, it's often very i'm just i have to like always force myself to remember that's that's no longer the name yeah you know yeah what I mean. um okay last publishing question so bringing a chinese sci-fi novel into english is a risk for a publishing house as we've talked about because well, there's lots of ways it could um, go wrong, seems a bit dramatic. There's lots of ways it could go unnoticed or underappreciated. And that means all the time and money that's been put in might not get a return, as well as, you know, it's, it's a shame just on a literary level that the book doesn't get or could potentially not get the appreciation it deserves. Um, I think you've talked a wee bit about that already. So um, after the success of uh, Liu Cixin and Three Body Problem, we've seen Tor and Head of Zeus take on uh, risks of going beyond just the works of the Otsushin and like short story collections like Invisible Planets. And they published uh, Bao Shu's The Redemption of Time and Chen Xiu Fan's Waste Tide. But that's just two books. It's still, it doesn't guarantee that there is a, I think you've been skeptical about the idea of there being a new wave or a trend of translated Chinese sci-fi. If, if, if I'm recalling correctly, you prefer to treat every book and every author as an individual instance an individual phenomenon, an individual success. So with, with all that in mind, um, why do you think Simon & Schuster 
and Hera Zeus this time took the risks uh, to publish Vagabonds by Hao Jinfang. Hao Jin, Hao, Hao Jinfang. Yeah, it, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I'm I'm deeply skeptical about the idea that there's anything like Chinese sci-fi or you know some sort of uh, a sudden wave of interest in in all quote unquote Chinese sci-fi, whatever that means. Um, every every um, speculative fiction book coming out of China that I've read um, seems so different from every other book. I mean, yes, you, you can put them into buckets and say, well, these are very similar. And, you know, the same way you can do with books coming out of Germany or France or the U.S. Um, and I, I'm sure you can run your, um, you know, big data analysis and and say this book has a 90 percent chance of replicating success of some other book and so on and so forth um although you know I, I say that i'm not entirely sure that the publishing industry actually is quite that advanced um but the bottom line is i i don't think any of that actually um uh, works in real life I, I i think the way books succeed or fail is very idiosyncratic and very contingent on circumstances. Um, Bao Xu um, is an amazing author, but the book that Tor published by him is essentially um, a, a paraquel or a kind of fanfic set in the three-body universe. So right. I feel like there's not a whole lot of risk there. Chen Jiufan is widely lauded and has a worldwide profile. He's often you know, a guest at literary festivals everywhere. So publishing his novel, to me, also doesn't feel like a huge risk either. Um, right. I, I could be wrong. I'm not claiming that, you know, this, it's, these are easy decisions, but it just doesn't seem to me like these are huge risks. In the case of Vagabonds, I think Hao Jinfang may not be as well known yet um, as, as Liu Cixin and Bao Shu and Chen Jiufan, perhaps. But she is somebody who's amazing, and we'll talk more about her, um, I'm sure. So, so I can go into a little more depth there. But um, she is, uh, you know, a genuine uh, celebrity uh, in a way. I think some uh, some readers who only know her as an author don't realize uh, this is someone who is um, an entrepreneur who gets invited to do world conferences. Um, in Switzerland and, and, and Dubai all the time to talk about education and her nonprofit enterprise. So in some ways, her identity as an author is is secondary. It's sort of like sometimes people who listen to this podcast may know me as the translator and they think that, you know, uh, that's the main thing I do in the way mm -hmm. that, you know, Pao Jinfang is mainly an author. But, you know, in the same way that for her, writing is very secondary to her main work uh translation is very secondary to my main work um she she has a worldwide presence and platform uh and and i think taking her book out given all the work she's done in other realms and and the kind of message she has um is is also very sensible um this is not a book in my view that's typical whatever that means sci-fi you know in quotes um mm -hmm. it's 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 it has a lot of potential to reach crossover audiences um because it really isn't very much about concerned with um the kind of futurism or future prediction or future imagined possible futures uh kind of sci-fi that we often think about as within core sci-fi this is not like that this is not within core sci-fi uh it's it's a very different book it's much more philosophical and much more about asking foundational questions about what it means to be free, what it means to be equal, what it means to um, receive according to your merit, and what it means to have a political system uh, that actually is responsive to the needs of the people. Um, mm -hmm. It asks all sorts of complicated, difficult questions, um, not just for readers in China, but actually for readers around the world. I and mean, I think that's what makes it transcendent. Uh, it's, it's not a book that's meant for a specific moment or a specific audience. It's, it's meant for a much broader audience. Uh, and the most amazing thing is she wrote this book many years ago when she was a much younger and less mature author. Oh, uh, right. So, you know, it's 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 incredible to me um, to imagine what her next book will be like, which she's working on. So anyway, super exciting to me uh, to see this book out. Mm, if you can pardon my uh, ignorance, because I, I should have checked this. When was this book uh, published in the original Chinese? Do you know which year? Oh, it's It's got to be at least a decade plus, 
Oh. I can't remember exactly when, but it was it was a long time ago. Um, Gosh, right. This is not a not a recent book. Mm. I'm not going to ask you to do this, but if anyone was reading it and trying to put it in the context of the times it was written, at least from Hao Jin Fang's perspective, and I guess that would be the the important one to take, they would have to remember it's not. It, I guess it's it's looking at timeless themes, but if you were really fixated on putting it in the time it was written, you'd have to remember that's not now. It's like you said, ten plus years ago. Um, Let me just that, do a quick yeah. check to see if I can get you the answer on this. Okay. Um, this this was published. I mean, I don't remember when it's published, but it's written certainly a long time ago. Um, mm. And yes, the other thing I, I can't been, find the yeah. exact date of, of when the original um, book was published because it was also published in multiple editions. Ah, I think right. the okay. first edition uh, when it came out was actually divided into two separate books, uh, and then it was combined together. Um, I, I can't remember the exact publishing history, but it was a long time ago. Okay, well, that's something listeners who are interested can can find out. And if you guys want to reach the show and, and educate me, please do. And if you guys don't know how, I'll be giving out like the show's social media at the end of the episode and possibly also at the start. When you were talking about Ha Jing Fang's other roles, that reminded me um, when I've done kind of somewhat lazy research for the show, I just type in authors' names into YouTube, especially if I know that they can <laughs> speak English and right. Ha Jing Fang can speak English. And this this applies to Chen Chiu Fan too, if I remember correctly. If you pop their um, their names just in Pinyin, so as they would appear in English, um, into YouTube, you get videos of them of them doing talks. And I think there are quite a few videos of Ha Jing Fang talking about her work. I'm sure there are some of Chen Chiu Fan as well. But I know in each case there are also videos of them talking about uh, business, economic, society. The, I guess the future, but not from a sci-fi angle, more like a where is the economy, where is this or that going? So yeah, just just to um, there is actual evidence you guys can find on YouTube that backs up what Ken's saying about Ha Jing Fang and Chen Xiu Fan, not just being authors, but having other roles, other jobs. Yeah, they 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 have all these these entire separate lives. Um, you know, um, Chen Xiu Fan is you know this amazing tech. Um, entrepreneur and and just I think most of it just never comes across in the publicity for the books, which I don't really understand why because it seems like people will be interested in that. Uh, but yeah, they they have entirely different lives, um, doing stuff, amazing stuff. Yeah, it's a bit mind boggling. Um, maybe it's only mind boggling because the um, they're not packaged as that way um, and not presented. So you find out later that there are these amazing um, entrepreneurs and people out there with them. Um, you know, existing outside the page. Um, but anyway, bef before I just start repeating myself, let's charge on and talk about the author herself, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Good. How do you find? So, so how do you found is, um, you know, this absolutely amazing individual. And uh, I'm really honored to call her my friend. Um, she graduated with a degree in physics and then went on to um, become a PhD in, um, in economics. And her day job is as uh, the deputy director for a quasi-governmental uh, think tank um, in China that focuses on research and development issues. Um, she writes reports uh, or oversees the um, composition of reports. I mean, she used to write them herself. I, I, I don't believe she does that herself anymore. I think she still right. provides schemes. Um, but um, the these are reports for given to the state council in China. And, and these are sort of policy recommendations and research reports that influence, um, you know, the highest policymaking organ in the world's second largest economy. Um, but other than that, um, she is also the founder of something called Tongxing Academy, um, which is a non-profit social enterprise dedicated to the education of underprivileged and rural children in China. It's This is just an absolutely amazing thing because uh, rural and, and, and rural education in not just uh, in, in around the world, in China, in parts of Latin America, in Africa, in, in all over Asia, that's been a deep passion of mine. And Hao um, Jingfang, uh, so, so I've been to this aspect of her work. She, as a researcher, um, you know, as an economic research and analyst, um, uh, had to do a lot of on-site visits to see what the reality in some of these extremely remote and poor 
regions of China uh, what, what life there is like. I think people don't understand how big and diverse a country China is uh, and how mm-hmm. unequal the development has been. You, you've got parts of China. I mean, Haji Zhang herself talks about this. She says that when, when she goes on these trips and she travels from Beijing to the most remote parts of China, um, in Yunnan or Guizhou or elsewhere, um, she feels like she's not just traveling through space, but through time. Um, there are parts mm-hmm. of China that has appears to have frozen 300 years ago, and people are literally digging for livelihoods out of the dirt. There is no electricity. Um, they are in isolated places with no roads lead to the outside, even to the outside. Um, or, you know, she goes to other places where the entire villages are, are depopulated because all the young, able-bodied adults have gone to the cities to look right. for work. And the people left behind are elderly grandparents along with children who never see their parents except once uh, during the lunar um, holiday, lunar New Year holidays. So these are, there's an entire generation of children growing up without their parents, without creative educational toys, without without really uh, all the things you associate with a normal childhood. Um, and um, and Ajin Khan says, you know, this is intolerable. Um, she has been deeply dedicated to the idea of um, combating inequality and, and, and trying to do good. Um, you know, I, I think if you read Floating Beijing, you'll see um, that aspect of her, that, that very rationalistic, uh, that deeply compassionate and empathetic soul um, guided yeah. by rational at work. And, and this is what she's dedicated her work to do. She, um, she used the publicity that came with winning the Hugo Award to do something that I think very few authors can claim to have done. She used that publicity to attract funding to form this nonprofit dedicated to the education of rural children. Her her goal is, she thinks, right, the, uh, what children are really lacking in these places um, um, mm-hmm. isn't just book learning, isn't just rote memorization or test-taking skills. She says what they're lacking the most is creative education, creativity. So this will be a theme that will recur in Bhagavan's course. She's right. she's a deep believer that fostering creativity in children is the most important thing we can do for any family, for any nation, for the entirety of the human race. That in order for us as a species to thrive in the future, we must foster creativity and unlock the potential of every human being on this planet in as broad a way and as deep a way as possible. So Mm -hmm. her foundation hires teachers that send them to these remote places to teach art, to teach creativity, to teach children how to tell stories, make paintings, um, bring their own imagination to life. And these are children who haven't even had toys. You know, this is an incredibly difficult task. She's thrown herself into hiring experts to develop curriculums for this. And and she's a deep believer in not relying on a charity model, but on a nonprofit social enterprise model, meaning she sells these curriculums to wealthy, privileged Um, relatively privileged families, uh, middle class and upper middle class families in the big cities of China. And these curriculums are very much loved and welcome because they're beautiful. They're they're so well done. They they teach children how to, you know, um, be creative and to free their own um, infinite potential. She sells these curriculums in the big cities. And then that allows her to fund the giving of these curriculum and classes and, and hiring teachers to send to the rural parts. Um, it's, mm-hmm. it's, an, it's an incredible, incredible model. Um, she's done this for multiple years, it works. Um, and, and she's being invited all over the world to World Economic Forum um, and education conferences to talk about her experience and what she's done. And I, I feel like to her, this is the most important work she's done. Um, and and, and, and I, I agree with her. It, it is incredible. And the fact that, you know, I, I get to know her as a, as a friend and to play a small role in helping her get to this point because Floating Beijing managed to give her the publicity to, to get this kickstarted. You know, I'm incredibly right. proud of that part of it, um, that, that I, I played a very tiny role in, in helping her on this. Um, and uh, it, it really is just so wonderful to see her succeed. And then, of course, other than that, I, I should also mention that beyond those incredibly accomplished jobs and, and, and entrepreneurship, um, she's also uh, running her own sci-fi IP studio to develop science fiction uh, novels and stories into for the right. film um, for in the screen. She's also 
uh, mother of two um, and uh, a, a wonderful mother. Uh, she also, um, right, I forgot, she also writes novels, right. So people are always thanks for that intro, Ken. Time and what, what do you, how do you do this? And, and I, I really think she probably has some way of, of, of slowing down time. Uh, there, there's no way to, to, for her to do everything she does um, otherwise. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's what I've thought in in regard to a few of the people I've encountered in my my journey learning about um, translated Chinese lit and and tra- and Chinese sci-fi. If if there is such a thing, it's it's incredible how some people do these things. Now I'm just trying to think back and remember the couple of things I wanted to mention. Yes, now one of them was I know that um, as as you mentioned, a lot of people, or maybe just in in the Western world, or it's even just outside of China, don't quite realize how diverse China is like geographically, culturally, in terms of um, wealth and wealth disparity. So at least um, geographic, well, yeah, at at least geographically, but in other aspects, I try to cover that diversity within one country on on the, and even China, the Chinese people extend beyond the boundaries of the country. So whatever the the idea of Chinese literature means on the podcast, I try to give it a nice well-rounded picture. So I've found a way to do that beyond just the stories I, I, I pick. Uh, another thing I've done is I've made a little map. I've made like a custom Google map and put it uh, on my site and I've links to it and whatnot. So every story we do on the podcast, and I'm, I'm more addressing the listeners than, than you can, I, I chart it on the map. Um, I think for this episode, I'm not entirely sure where I'm going to place on the map. I don't think Google Google Maps features Mars yet, but... I'll yeah, that's out. true. Good point. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do appreciate your efforts on that because it, it, it's sometimes incredibly hard for people to grasp this, you know, because um, we have this model of, of the nation state and there's a tendency among all people to sort of treat our home mm-hmm. groups as extremely diverse and outsider groups as monolithic. Um, right. But the two countries to which this is most particularly problematic, you know, are, are India and China. Um, they, they, right. There's just these both of these countries are just insanely diverse. You 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 just you cannot even understand how linguistically, culturally, um, in everything. I mean, you know, in, in China, it's it's extremely common for writers uh, to publish stories and then have to footnote their own stories and say this is a custom in such and such a region. Most of you probably don't know it, but it's true. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the and they're doing that for so... Chinese readers, not for foreign. Yes, readers. exactly. It's it, it's so often because you know many. Um, uh, it, it, it's very. It, it, the country is so vast and so different and um, so diverse that it's incredibly hard to say something is Chinese, um, whatever that means. Right. In the same way, it's incredibly hard to say something is Indian or something is American. Uh, that may be a model that most people understand. It's, it's incredibly hard to say what is, quote unquote, an American restaurant because it's so diverse. What, what does that mean? Um, yeah. So there you go. It's a, th- a thing on uh, Google Maps, bringing up Google Maps again, um, is that at least at least here in the UK, every restaurant, Google Maps tells you what kind of restaurant it is. So for Valentine's Day, me and my girlfriend went to one which Google Maps says is a British restaurant. But again, oh, I'm like, dear. what on earth is, what is British food? <laughs> what does that um, mean? <laughs> well, the dishes that we had were, I guess it's a little bit like, it's probably not, it's probably not even very equivalent to Ameri- an American restaurant. Um it's it's quite a range of stuff there is with i guess in the core there's things that you could call british a lot of meat and potatoes but then there's all these things taken from around the world i suppose but anyway i guess that was that was the idea of diversity i grew up with like you said in in, in the western world multicultural countries you hear the word diversity and it's really referring to the diversity that you have within your own country so in britain i guess it's i guess it's the post colonial the diversity that's arisen in, out of post colonialism and you don't. At least I was never pointed to the i pointed to consider the idea that other parts of the world have their own kinds of diversity. There are other, you know, it, it takes many forms, not just the form you're familiar with. Right. And I think part of that it has to do with the fact that um, the the reality of localism, of regionalism, of true diversity is at odds with the myth of nation states. Um, mm-hmm. Ever since the Enlightenment. Um, the Westphalian model of, of nation states um, has, has exerted a huge amount of pressure 
um, for countries, both the colonized and, and the colonizers, to um, hew closer and closer to the imagined vision of, of some um, some model of what it means to be French, to be to be German, to be British, to be J Japanese, and to be Chinese. And so, when these official efforts at standardizing and creating a pseudo national culture um, runs up against the reality that these are not real, that that there's an incredible amount of local variation and diversity, people can get sort of shocked. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think. Even folks in modern nation states often are shocked to discover how diverse their own countries actually are and that nation states are actually far more complicated. Uh, there is no one way to be British um, and there's no one way to be American um, or Chinese for that matter. You don't have to, as a Scottish person, you, you don't need to tell me um, how, how I'm considered to be British or not is different for every person I talk to. It's, it's a confusing world. Um, it's a really confusing world. Yeah, I wish people appreciated how confusing everything is. Yeah, and I'm sure as I get older, I'm only going to be more confused. So, good thing. Yeah, true, it is a good thing. So um, let's veer away from geopolitics back to Ha Jingfang and simple questions. So this is a simple question with a long preface, which I'll try and scoot through quickly. So when I was doing my uh, lazy YouTube research for the Folding Beijing episode, I found what I would call a really wholesome video. And it was uh, the recording of Ha Jingfang collecting or being awarded her Hugo Award. The, I think it was the uh, short novel or novella award for um, Folding Beijing. And first she gives a speech in the video and you're standing on the stage nearby looking very happy for her. And then you give a wee speech after her. And I think you could just see like visual proof on your face that backs up uh, what you wrote in your intros to the Invisible Planets and Broken Stars um, Chinese sci-fi anthologies that... The authors you translate are your friends and the ones who you think are just the most awesome rather than like you trying to objectively work out who are the best authors writing science fiction in China or who are the most sellable and marketable. It's really just you emphasize it's your own favorites and you could see on the stage there that was one of your favorites, one of your friends getting the prize. Um, so the question I've got is a really simple one. What do you? I guess we already know why you think Hao Jingfang is awesome. You've gone into that in great detail. But why, what do you think makes her writing awesome? So Hao Jingfang writes in a very unique style, in my view. Um, I, I don't even know how to explain this, uh, but she writes in a style that I think um, some people would describe as translation needs. Um, so uh, let me unpack that a little bit. So. Um, Contemporary Chinese writing is mostly done in what's described as modern standard Chinese, uh, which is a Mandarin variant. Um, and it is it has a deep history in Bai Huawen. But to be honest, um, the best way to think about it is it's comparable to uh, a newly emerging vernacular literature, similar to the way that during the Renaissance vernacular literature has emerged in Europe, uh, Italian, Spanish, um, right. so on and so forth. I, can I so, interject slightly yeah. here? So the ideas of vernacular Chinese popped up in the very first episode I did. At, it was about Lu Xun and his Diary of a Madman, and the idea of yep. anytime a new culture writer, which is the movement Lu Xun was in, um, for any new listeners who haven't heard me go on about this stuff before, any of the other new culture writers we covered were also pushing for the advancement of vernacular Chinese in literature. So I just want to check, when you say vernacular, are you talking about the same thing I talked about in those episodes? Yes. Or are you talking about something yes. even more modern? It's the same one. Uh, okay. it's, it's continuous, let's put it that way. So right. I, I, I would say that it is continuous. Like, in, in other words, modern standard written Chinese is obviously a continuation of the Bai Huawen movement that Lu Xun was participating in. It is, of course, evolved away from that, but it is definitely mm. You can see it is, you know, evolved from the same language. Um, so what I would say is because um, serious literature being composed in um, modern standard written Chinese is a relatively recent phenomenon, not many generations have accumulated around it. It's mm -hmm. stylistically very fluid. So, of course, it's deeply influenced by traditional vernacular Chinese novels from the Ming Qing dynasties and also all the oral storytelling traditions and all the written versions based on that and so on and so forth. So some writers who are particularly attuned to that 
strain of, of the evolution of modern standard written Chinese writing that style that's closer to um, perhaps in some ways to the way people speak. Um, Hao Jingfang does not, in my view, write quite like that. Her writing is much more deeply influenced by translations. Um, and this is a very common phenomenon you see in vernacular literatures. So again, in the Renaissance, when you have Italian modern English and, um, and modern Spanish works being written, um, all of these works show a huge amount of classical influence, uh, influences from classical languages. So, um, you know, one example would be Milton's Paradise Lost, which literally treats English, um, which is not a um, language with a lot of strong declensions, as though mm. it were a, a strongly heavily inflected language like Greek or Latin. And so some of the sentences in, in Milton are virtually incomprehensible unless you realize that he was writing English as though it were a strongly inflected language. Um, so, you know, it's, it's sort of translation niche-ish or whatever. Uh, translation niche refers to the idea of Chinese that's heavily influenced by translation models from Western languages, primarily English, but also French um, and German and, and, and quite a bit of Japanese. Um, in fact, some people right. argue that the influence through Japanese is even stronger than English. I, I think that's debatable. Um, right. Anyway, the point is, when you read Han Jin the, 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 the way she writes is not, um, it, it, it's not, um, I don't know quite how to put this. It's it, it shows a very strong set of influences from translations from other languages, and it it feels in some ways better suited to express her ideas, which are almost always universal and cosmopolitan rather than specifically Chinese, whatever that means. Right. Um, she's, she's quite unlike many authors who are deemed as uh, masters of of of. Um, the idea of Chineseness. She's not like that at all. She's much more interested in writing, um, uh, both in terms of her her content and her ideas um, about mm -hmm. universal themes, and her writing itself exhibits that kind of quality. So I think the story is unique in that way. Some people like that style. Some people don't. Some people find translation needs very grating. Uh, as Chinese readers. Um, I don't particularly find that way. I have a much more cosmopolitan taste. I enjoy works that are clearly derived and 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 hue to ideas of classical beauty. Um, I think they're very beautiful. But I also mm. enjoy the experimental work that Hao Jifang does, which incorporates a huge amount of translation needs into her writing. Uh, I mean, the fact that she calls her ship Malus is, you know, an example. It's um, um, it's it's just she just throws it in there uh, with little concern about how people will feel about it. Yeah, you literally read my mind there. I was going to say, and this is why you've chosen Mars, uh, Mars as the word of yep. the the word of the day. So there we go. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So what you were saying about the stories not necessarily being specific to China or um, imbued with Chineseness, but being universal. So this this exact point came up between me and my guest, uh, uh, Lu Guanzhao, uh, on the Folding Beijing episode when we were talking about, well, talking about the whole thing. And on every episode, there's usually a bit where I try and say, what's what's the unique Chinese aspect of this story? And despite the fact Folding Beijing is called, called Folding Beijing, it's set in Beijing, a future version, there's almost nothing you can, at least I found, that I could latch onto apart from maybe the, the food that people are eating. And even that's just there to indicate uh, class distinctions. And uh, Guan Zhao, my guest, kind of agreed with me. Yeah, it, it could easily be folding London. Uh, that's where he's staying, organizing the uh, the London Chinese sci-fi book club. So yeah, folding Beijing, folding London, and then in Fagabonds, I think you can see that even more. It's It's a story about humanity not really about any particular culture or country. Right. Absolutely. Agree with that 100%. Yeah. She so... perhaps more than many other authors explicitly tries to do that. And, and I think it has to do with the fact that, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, Vagabond shows clearly that her her philosophical influences are very Western. Uh, and, and that's mm. what she wanted to do. She wants to write a very universalist book that hues to the tradition of, um, of Neoplatonism and uh, Enlightenment. That's that's what she was doing. Mm -hmm. So speaking of kind of taking influence from the West or from another culture, another world, and looking at this story, although we haven't talked about the story, at the fundamental level, it's about being between 
Earth and Mars, two societies, two systems. Um, although we will touch more on this later, I'd like to ask you if you know whether Hao Jingfang has herself ever really been between two worlds in any way, since well, Mars, and, Mars and Earth are supposed to stand in for something, some kind of two worlds, whatever that yeah, may be. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about that. Um, so, so a couple of words. Um, I mean, I, I do think um, it's very tempting to read um, an author's work through their their lives. Biography, yeah. Um, yeah, and then and, and I, I, I want to caution readers against it. Uh, mm. Some of it is self-serving because I, as an author, often get subjected to this sort of thing and it annoys me to no end. Um, you know, there are people who come to me and ask me how my relation with my mother is because I wrote the paper Menagerie and I'm oh, sort no. of like, the Lord. Um, and, and and the thing is, you know, Angus, I, I mean, we all know this because this is, this is the sort of thing you rarely ask, um, you know, straight... Uh, white males of a certain age and and, 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 and and approach. Like the idea is some authors are universalist authors who are praiseworthy imagination. And no one thinks right. that somehow their individual biographies limit what they do. But other authors um, um, often get read as though they're doing nothing other than enacting and performing their biography for the audience for their delectation and and i just don't think it's going be fair so having said all that i will mm -hmm. say han jingfang has traveled extensively and in fact lived abroad um in her youth um so you know make of that what you will i i believe when she's describing the psychology of loying um living on earth as a young girl as a teenager um, and, and trying to deal with cultural shock and so on and so forth. I, I think some of that is drawing on um, uh, Hao Jingfang's real experiences in the sense that, um, you know, I draw on my own experiences as an immigrant when I'm writing about a lot of stories of alienation and encountering new cultures. But mm -hmm. it's not autobiographical in the sense that I'm literally saying this is what happened to me. And I don't think she's saying this is literally what happened to her, but some of the psychology um, she could describe vividly because she went through something um, similar to that. Um, and then and you were saying, you know, the whole idea of between two worlds and what are the two worlds. Um, so I, I do want to get into that a little bit deeply. I think it's super tempting and, and, and super reasonable for readers to come to this and say, Mars and Earth are two worlds at war, and they have two entirely different political and economic systems, and they are deeply suspicious of each other. So they must stand in for China and the US or China and the West or something like that. Mm. Um, and I, I, I want to tell readers that that is a perfectly fine reading if you want to go there. Uh, but it also means that you're sort of missing the most interesting aspect of the book by reading that way. Because if you try to apply that model a little bit deeper, you'll realize that um, nothing works under that model nothing no, matches it's, it's not like a one for one reading it's right it's, limiting. It's, it's sort of like it's sort of like when you're reading um ursula k le guin's um you know the left hand of darkness or the dispossessed or all of those novels and you read the two sides as the soviet union uh being anaris and the united states and the western bloc is uras then you're sort of missing the point entirely uh because that means the novel has no relevance once the cold war is ended but uh, and it, it hasn't has transcended huge... the boundaries of what's possible in our in the world as it was then it's not that's, imaginative that's right that's right and if you read the dispossessed today of course you realize that you know the the the, the anarchist collectivist um utopia of, of anaris is, is nothing like the soviet union in fact it's exactly it's in some ways the counter soviet union um mm -hmm. and if you read um uh vagabonds you realize that mars is nothing like china it's it's it's, it's small it's, it's it's tiny. That's the most important thing. It's uh, in fact, I think the Martian system, uh, as the characters themselves point out, cannot possibly function um, above the level of a city state. It only works because Mars is a city state. It's a state that is perpetually in, engaging revolution against itself, and it is a, a, a collectivist, engineered utopia which is deeply dedicated to the idea of democracy and republicanism, but nonetheless supports authoritarian rulers and is dedicated to individual freedom and creativity. These are things that we normally don't think of as fitting into one. We just, we can't imagine how they would just work together. And they do. 
Uh, and Mars mm -hmm. does not actually function like China because, you know, if you're talking about a society that's dedicated to the idea of promoting creativity and, and, and individual um, achievement within that realm, then, you know, <laughs> Uh, good luck finding that in China. Um, so right. yeah. Mars is not China. And Earth is also not our Earth. It's it's a hyper-capitalist, hyper-intellectual um, property-oriented society. Um, yeah. and, and it can function like sort of a caricature of today's world, I suppose, if you really want to push for it. But I think yeah. that's also limiting. It's, it's not quite like that. It actually Earth, in some ways, in, in the book, shows another philosophical approach to organizing human beings. Um, and I, I think perhaps the best way to think about what she's trying to do in this book is to just go back to what she herself said. Um, in, in the book, at one point, the characters say that, you know, these are the words that move people. Um, freedom, merit, equality. And every generation takes one of these as their banner of revolution and pursues it um, mm -hmm. and realize only to realize at the very end that in the pursuit of one of these qualities, the others, too, have been neglected and destroyed. And so their children will rebel against them. Um, and, and society is in perpetual revolution as a result of that. And I think that's actually a very good way to think about it. That's that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's gotten rather dark where I'm sitting, so I'm just going to go in. I was using natural light coming in the window, the window I saw the sparrowhawk through. That light's going away, so I'm just going to leave my microphone, turn on the light, come back. So, uh, give me a few seconds. Okay, now I can see my questions again. Fantastic. So, my next question was going to be, can you summarize and tell us what are the societies on Earth and Mars in the story like. I think we've done that. Have we missed anything or do you think the listeners have got the right idea? I think they got the basic idea, but let me just try to summarize a little bit. So Earth is um, a society in which nation st states still exist, but all the nations are hyper-capitalist and hyper-dedicated to the idea of intellectual property being the most important kind of uh, product. Um, and this in this in this world of incredible uh, a teeming sea of humanity. For some reason, though, um, creativity actually has been stifled. Um, Earth appears to be not a place in which a huge amount of innovation is happening for whatever reason. It's a um, homogenized fact, place, right? Somehow, yeah. Well, we're not clear exactly why, but, but somehow mm -hmm. either the system or, or the, the interlocking rules about creativity, uh, sorry, about intellectual property um, somehow has stifled creativity on um, um, Earth. And so the people of Earth look to Mars as kind of an incubator and an originator of new ideas. And Earth, Mars is a tiny, tiny world of colonies that have broken away from Earth um, after a war, um, somewhat similar to the American War of Independence. Um, and the Martian society is tiny. I, I think the population is no more than 20 million. Uh, it's a city state. Uh, mm. It's run along the, uh, it's administered in a way very similar to the Greek city states of uh, Platonic time. And it is very, very uh, dedicated to the whole idea of, um, of, of, of fostering creativity within each individual. The Martians are super proud of the fact that their education system is entirely focused around fostering creativity for each child. Uh, right. But at the same time, they they don't seem um, to want the children to understand their own revolutionary past or history. In fact, mm. Mars is not a utopia at all, as people find out. Um, it's, a, it's a deeply repressive society, despite the huge dedication to freedom. Uh, paradoxically, um, a society founded on freedom has turned authoritarian and, 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 and made it impossible to even speak about the past. Um, and so as you go through the novel, you find out the, the waves of revolution that have uh, convulsed Martian society and why every generation rebels against its injustices and, and how um, it's not a simple choice between Earth and Mars because both are actually utopias and both dystopias at the same time. Uh, and while there is some idea that the two can learn from each other, it's not clear what that means. Uh, and the mm -hmm. book is heavily um, uh, uh, philosophical, it quotes extensively from the French existentialists, Greek neoplatonists, um, and, and so on and so forth. And it just it becomes very hard to wrap your mind around, I think, if you ended up wanting to 
go deeply into it. It's also not, in my view, a traditional character-driven story in the way a lot of contemporary commercial fiction tends to be. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think we have such an obsession with character-driven commercial fiction that we think that's the only aesthetically pleasing way of writing a book. This is not like that. Um, the folks in the in the book make explicit speeches at each other, uh, and 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 there are extensive quotations from philosophers. And you know, characters talk to each other about philosophy and and, and debate over philosophy and, and argue over intellectual property laws and and write propagandistic plays. Um, right. And so every very explicit in some way. And and if you are not used to that style of writing, you may find the story deeply alienating. Um, but I, I encourage readers to look beyond that and get into it because um, there is more than one way to tell a beautiful story. And I think the story is very beautiful um, and, and, and thoughtful and deep. Uh, but you have to be willing to accept that there's there are other ways to tell a wonderful story that evokes deep emotions than to follow the modern character driven quote unquote approach. Yeah, it's a it's a reflective and philosophical tale. It's it's not a page turner and it's not full of actions and explosions and mass deaths like you might find in Three Body. Like like you've emphasized with the tra- the sci fi from China you've translated. Each author, each story is its own thing. Don't look for like a, especially I think especially in the case of this book, if you think it's just going to be another three body book just because it's sci-fi from China, like you're you're in for disappointment on that front. I think that's fair to say. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So now that you've laid out Earth and Mars and the two societies, I have to ask you, which one would you rather live on if you were forced to choose one? You know, this is not as easy a, a question as, as one might think. Um, there's no question that Earth is much more familiar to us. Um, if we had to right. pick one just because we want to live with the devil we know, Earth is more, uh, you know, more uh, tolerable, it seems. Despite all of the problems with late capitalism, um, we sort of know how to survive in it. Mars is a radically different society. Um, this is a society in which, you know, um, the idea of your creation and, and what you produce is directly connected with what you can with the value you create, quote unquote, is directly correlated with your status and the economic reward that you receive has been broken. Um, it's 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 the kind of collectivist society that only functions at a very small scale, like a kibbutz or something like that. Um, mm. And you have to sort of be radical, be prepared for a radically different way of viewing this. I mean, but there are aspects of it that are very attractive. And 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 Hanji Fang makes it super clear. Um, if you're an author, right, when you're working in a very commercial late capitalist society like the one we have, I mean, we're not actually dystopian yet, I suppose. Um, um, mm-hmm. But but I think every author feels the need to somehow make a living, quote unquote, right. So either you work a day job or you figure out how to make your book sell. I mean, the idea that you have to create value to to receive reward is so fundamental to the way that we think that we don't question it. Um, we sometimes mistake rent seeking for value creation in our fiat economy for that reason. Yep. Um, we, we, we think that whatever late capitalism is, the idea that you work for a living, that you exchange labor and intellectual creations, that you have to actually appeal to the market in order to succeed. We, we yeah. think that's perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with that. We, we yeah. think that's just like the way it ought to be. Um, mm-hmm. But on Mars, you don't do that. There's there's no market. Um, the On Mars, the idea is that it doesn't matter what, what regardless of your um, how popular your thing is, you're going to receive a basic standard of living. You're going to get your house. You're going to get your food. You're going to get your transportation you're going to get your medical needs met um you will be fine it's sort of like universal basic income taken to its logical conclusion you Mm -hmm. you will be fine even if you do nothing um but you are encouraged to be creative to 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 make things not because you can get rich and wealthy from it because you can't um in fact in on mars um the the people from Earth think that all Martians are being exploited because you know people could come up with wonderful innovations and they cannot patent it or or copyright it or whatever and 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 they even find the idea repulsive they just they just give it away to the yeah. Martian people um, and and uh, the the 
the delegates from Earth find this intolerably exploitative, but that's not how the Martians see it. Um, you create for the joy of creation and, and for the fact that um, you may find your audience. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. the Martians do compete. They compete with each other to see who can get more people to like their stuff. But it's Citations, not... right? Citations, exactly. It's very academic in that way. It's sort of like yeah. an academic environment. Citations are awesome, but um, you can really create and do what you want to do. If you want to do experimental films that no one wants to watch, go for it. Um, as long as you're happy and you're fulfilling your own need to create, uh, which is a deep human fundamental need, that's okay. Like mm -hmm. that aspect of Mars is incredibly attractive especially to people who are creative. Um, there's there's a lot of beauty to, to that view of life. But, you know, of course, the reality is, as you find out, the Martian society, that, that utopian aspect, cannot be sustained um, without some very ugly um, aspects as well. And, and that's mm -hmm. what, you know, Floyd has to find out and, and decide for herself. Yeah, I got, there's so many, so many uh, things I could say in reply. Um, to the two things that are like at the front of the queue of my mind or my tongue one's um that i would definitely want to live in the martian society you know i'm doing this wee niche podcast with something like 250 listeners <laughs> not making not making an awful lot of money doing freelancing and although this isn't really a long-term viable future for future for me i love it so much it's amazing but you so, get what i mean right as a creator yeah. you get what i mean like it's cool you don't have to care about the market like you mm -hmm. can just do it because you love it yep and so long as i know that there's people not citing it but um enjoying it it doesn't have to i don't really have the capitalist mindset of my growth must expand and expand and expand okay it'd be nice if it doesn't shrink but the point is doing it <laughs> doing it something doing something high-minded but then again like that's me all my pals here in my hometown of dundee uh pretty much all of them do engineering and i do wonder how bothered would they how keen would they be to live in a society where it's like okay the um the thingamajig you've designed the valve or whatever it, its success will be measured by how much it's cited and used and there's not much of a career path for you per se maybe they would like that i don't know but it seems like it's a society of the mind and if you are not of the mind if your interests are more i don't know dynamic or entrepreneurial maybe not um, so that's the first thing that was at the queue in my brain. And the other things about, like you're saying, the things that you need to sustain this and the fact it can only exist on a small scale. I remember when I was um, like end of high school, start of uni, I had some very idealistic uh, lefty beliefs, which I still have to an extent. They're just, they've come into more contact with reality now. Um, and one book I, I remember reading and being inspired by was Homage to Catalonia by um, George Orwell, where long story short, he volunteers for the Spanish Civil War, where uh, there's a leftist, democratic, communist, socialist, whatever coalition coming up against a conservative, reactionary, fascist rebellion. And the rebellion ends up winning. George Orwell's on the losing side. But he gets, just by an accident, he doesn't end up with the Soviet Union aligned international brigades, where most of the volunteers went. He ends up with a anarchist uh, division in the Catalan region who are as well as being kind of anarchist in the same way that the Mars, the Martian society here is like, as, how can I, I won't go into that. It's too, it's too much of a, it's too complicated. But, it's um, too complicated, but I, I know what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They're, they're, um, they're not the Soviet Union. They are more grassroots, let's say. They're less centralized. And it, it actually the, makes a huge difference, though, that, that, that some people, sometimes people don't understand that it makes a huge difference. Like, mm -hmm. you can have, quote-unquote, communism working at the level of the kibbutz. It's fine. It's just that when yeah. you scale it up to the level of the Soviet Union, that you have tragedy. You, you just, mm -hmm. that, that's something that people have a hard time wrapping their minds around. Scale yeah. matters. Well, it's not just scale, though. It's also outside pressure. Like, they had an, this um, Catalonian kind of nationalist anarchist movement had a military that George Orwell describes as they their society was totally flat level egalitarian DIY do it yourself their military had the most effective structure for a military which is hierarchical top down but they made sure that um there wasn't the class the old class differences weren't um, built into that so ranking officers were still ranking officers but they weren't the wealthiest people from society so it's really mm -hmm. amazing to read but what he doesn't say outright but which you kind of realize upon reflection is this thing existed in wartime they were yes. fighting for their existence not just against the fascists who were coming for them but later they were also under under attack from 
basically on Soviet, the so orders of the Soviet Union's international brigades or whatever, there were skirmishes between them. So they had a lot to fight for and strive for, and they were under pressure from all sides. And the same thing applies kind of here. The Martians have something, a big other, and not just an imaginary other, a real threatening one, Earth, to define themselves against. And like it applies here in Scotland as well. In Scotland, the nationalism you find is nice nationalism. It's not scary. It's not xenophobic. It's not directed at the minorities within our country. But kind of the unspoken thing is it's because the other is England, the big baddie. And I do wonder if you took away England, who would we turn on? Who would the other be? It's a That's a great question for so many things outside of this novel, too. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm totally with you. In fact, the all of these things are sort of you know spoken about uh, in, in the novel or touched upon in some ways too. I, I think one of the things that I want to make sure readers get is that um, the, this novel is so interesting because she really does get into all the implications of it. I mean, there are just long, long debates and examinations into how can the Martian society actually work and what are the problems when you do things this way. I mean, she talks about how when you take away uh, the incentive to, to create for a living, you create some good results, but also some terrible results. Um, people start seeking status um, within the organization, within the bureaucracy, uh, and there is quite a bit of rent seeking uh, going on. You know, it's very academic in the sense that folks start realizing that um, to get higher status, you often have to appeal to your super superiors and 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 that becomes more important than just creating things and and so right. you you set up society to be a certain way but it doesn't actually work out that way because people always find the path of least resistance and then that that often is in fact not what you desire um mm -hmm. so it, it, it's interesting and also you know there's a huge debate over whether mars actually is a democracy or not and and i think that section is is very important because um in many ways mars is based on uh, greek city-states and and, mm -hmm. and then you have the question of is this actually a democracy or not um there are long debates over as the consul whether um you know the Loing's grandfather, who is the supreme leader of Mars, actually is a dictator or not. And, and those debates are very meaningful. And I, I do encourage readers to read them and think about it, um, whether Hans is actually a dictator or not. Um, there, there are both ways of reading it. And then how you read it, I think, determines in a lot of ways how you think about this book. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so here's something we've touched on a little bit about how the book might not strictly be sci-fi or if it is sci-fi, it's not your traditional conventional sci-fi. So I, I learned, um, I think it was when I was doing, no, I don't think, I know, when I was doing my um, dissertation on the publishing of translated Chinese sci-fi, I was looking at uh, which things aren't translated and published in English as well. And I learned that Hao Jingfang doesn't just write sci-fi. She's a, She's got some literary fiction, but it does not exist in translation. And the realist stuff, I wonder if it ever will. I Probably not anytime soon. Um, so she does this literary fiction as well as speculative fiction, like sci-fi and this book, whether it is sci-fi or not, is a philosophical question. Um, so yeah, the, the fact that she has these other styles of books makes sense to me because this is such a pondering philosophical book, although it does have like the odd flash of uh, hard sci-fi. It's, it's not vice versa. It's not a lot of hard sci-fi with the odd bit of philosophy. And the thing it was kind of reminding me of, and there is an obvious thing that pointed me towards this because... Um, the author, Ursula K. Le Guin, she's got a book, who is, how could I best describe her, not being an expert. She writes um, fantasy and sci-fi and all sorts of things from a very kind of left field. I'll say left field rather than left wing. She does a lot of ecological, uh, feminist, anthropological. anthropological, that's a very key word, philosophical fantasy and sci-fi <laughs> books. Um, so I read The Dispossessed, and this, obviously, there's some, it's about Mars and Earth, one's capitalist one is not so there's really obvious parallels there but there's another Ursula K. Le Guin book this reminded me of it's part of her Earthsea series I think it's no oh, it's the third or the fourth one I don't know but it's called Tehanu I think it's the fourth one yeah I think Tehanu it's the fourth one. yeah the, the fourth one I've and I've only read those four um because Tehanu it's a slow book and there's an interpretation on the Wikipedia article for it which I read beforehand which um framed me to read it as like an kind of like a almost like an anti-fantasy book it kind of avoids epic action lots of plot points quests really direct conflict that's all kind of stripped away or swapped out or which, whichever verb you prefer for some 
a kind of story which is set in a made up world with magic uh, and all sorts of wonderful things but w- those are all backgrounded the foreground is a slower social thoughtful almost like domestic story although she cheats a bit at the end and brings in some bangs which i guess to some extent <laughs> I'm not trying to say Hajime Fan does the same thing. The action does pick up towards the end, maybe in like the final act. But anyway, what I want to ask with that massive preamble is, do you think there's something equivalent going on here in Vagabonds? Do you think Hajime Fan is playing with what sci-fi can be? Or do you think she's just writing what she wants to write? Although I know that authorial intent, guessing it might not always be the best idea. So maybe rather than what you think she's doing, what do you feel from the book itself. Yeah, no, that, that's a great way to phrase it because I, I don't want to um, get into her intent because, you know, she's spoken extensively about her own approach and you right. know, I don't want to say anything that obviously explicitly contradicts what she's articulated as her rationale. She's said multiple times that she enjoys writing speculatively because it's simpler. Um, when she wants to examine some issue and one of her core issues is inequality, and the definition of inequality and how to resolve it. Um, when you write about inequality in the real world, you it's very hard to do so without tacking in all sorts of complexities about history, about ethnic identity, about languages, and so on and so forth that make the issue hard to see. Because reality is so complex, layered, and nuanced, you, you can never definitively point to some one thing and say, this is the cause, or this is the effect, and this is the thing I want to examine. In mm-hmm. speculative fiction, you can. You can strip away all that complexity and just perform a thought experiment and say, this is the one thing that changed and it leads to all these consequences. So... You know, as um, as somebody uh, who I, I, I now now I'm just sort of like speculating. I'm saying that you know, with an economist, um, uh, a discipline that's sort of deeply involved in model building and simplifying the real world through models to gain insights. I think she's very in tune with that approach, and she uses her speculative fiction in that way. Um, and and you're right. I I think you you can sort of view Vagabonds as exactly that. It's an attempt to do a thought experiment by simplifying lots of things and and, 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 and focusing on one thing. But it's not your typical sci-fi experiment. It's not about the technology that's invented or something like that. It's about how can we organize societies just in entirely different ways and what does that mean? So mm-hmm. it is, um, I, I think I think the book is challenging for a lot of readers, not just abroad, but also in China. I think many Chinese readers um, I okay. I can't say many. Uh, I mean, I mean, many is is correct because there are many people who read her books. Period. So any segment will be many. Um, but, so yeah, a, a a certain number of readers, I think, find uh, vagabonds frustrating because it's not what they want in a sci-fi book. They want lots more of the hard sci-fi stuff. They they want a lot, lot more of the mathematics about how do you build a flying machine on Mars? How do you um, uh, what what happens to your bodies under the the um, force of reduced gravity? Um, they right. want a lot more of that stuff. And there's some of it in Vagabonds, but it's not the focus. It's clearly the sort of thing how you found through in here and there. It's not it's not what she's interested in. She's writing something that is marketed sci-fi, but it does something very different from hard sci-fi for sure but at the mm-hmm. same time it, it is it's not so calm i mean you know hard sci-fi often is is, is implied as you know being associated with with vigor and, and rigor and, and so on and so forth um and, right. and it's, it's very rigorously done and, and 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 this is this is actually a very rigorously done uh philosophical work it's just not rigorous in the way that a lot of hard sci-fi fans want that's not where it's not energy an, is not an engineer's rigor it's like not philosophical it's rigor not. yes and so i think that's 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 hard for some readers to wrestle with so if you go in expecting like you were saying earlier um, a very hard sci-fi uh, novel or a space opera or some kind of um, soft, um, explicitly political book about how evil the Chinese system is, you're not going to find that here. That's not what this is. This book is much more thoughtful and much more, if I may, I think Hong Kong is writing for an imaginary audience 100 years in the future rather mm. than an audience in the present. Um, and I think that's that's why this book is the way it is. 
Right. So a hundred years from now, I'll Skype call you again and we can see if that's right. Yes. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Okay. Next question. Um, so this I've got um, this one's just written down as a paragraph. So I'm just going to read the paragraph, and then at the end of the paragraph, we'll reach the question. So I felt that Hao Jingfang did a pretty good job of showing both the upsides and the downsides of Martian society, as we've kind of already discussed. Um, you've already mentioned slightly that they don't really teach the history of their own society, and I don't really want to spoil the plot. So without spoilers, um, our heroes, the vagabonds of the title. And a lot of other people in the society are pretty unaware of both the kind of highs and the lows or the drama and conflict of their society's revolutionary past or maybe multiple revolutionary pasts, as you've kind of hinted at. And that kind of brought me back to because our, our protagonists, the vagabond characters, are they're teenagers. So even if this book isn't, I suppose you could read it as a teen fiction or YA book. Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it could work on like that. That favorite book I mentioned earlier by Marcus Zusak, uh, "I'm the Messenger." It's the same. You could read that as a teenager or an adult, and it's not quite the same book either way around. But it's an equally good book either way around. This one is a very different book, but probably I think a similar deal. Um, anyway, it it brought me back to the module I did in my undergrad university days on children's lit. Children's lit studies is a really great. Um, it's great because the academic writing on it is clear and makes sense and is not full of sophistry. It's very to the point and it makes points that are insightful, easy to understand, not too abstract. One of those points was it was just pointing out that in a lot of children's and young adults literature, the story is kind of a like an archaeological dig in a way. It's a the child or young person main character learns about the past, but it's their past, the people that came before them. It's often their parents' generation or the generation before that and all the society that was there before them, before they were born. And that's maybe one reason why the char- those characters' parents are often dead, just like uh, Luo, Luo Ying in this story. Her parents are passed away. Just like when I was reading uh, Harry Potter, his parents are gone. And to some extent, or some of the plot is dedicated to finding out about his parents and the people they were at school with. And there's another series I read, A Series of Unfortunate Events, which as it progresses is more and more about what came before these characters were born, before they really knew what was going on. So all that preamble aside, uh, or with all that preamble in mind, my question for you is, is like the clouding of history in uh, the Martian society, do you think that's the necessity of a plot which is about young people? Or do you think it's an in Again, intention, tricky word. Maybe does it come across to you as an authoritarian flaw in the Martian society in in the book? Um, so the way I read it is, I think it's um, it's a cautionary note about how all societies um, need to justify who they are by telling themselves a story. Um, right. So you know, this is very dear and near to my own work. Um, I, I, I think Hansi Fan's work sort of illustrates this point rather than articulates it explicitly, but, but I'll, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll try to reconcile the, the two. A lot of stuff is articulated explicitly, but this one isn't. No one right. has a speech so, about how bad it is to cover up history, I don't, as right. far as I, I remember. I, 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 think, I think the point um, is rather that every society actually, in order to function, needs a story to, to explain itself. It needs a uh, a foundational mythology is how I call right. it. So, you know, America has a uh, has a founding story, and and so does um, the People's Republic of China, and so does the Republic mm-hmm. of China before it, and so does um, every and other. Those are all revolutionary ones. Those ones. That that's true. I I did focus on those uh, for a particular reason. Um, all of these stories have a revolutionary founding event, and they, in order to justify their continued existence, they have to keep on making sense of that origin and and to say this is the way things are because this is the way things must be and it makes sense because here's the story. I think what Hanji Fang is sort of getting at is all societies and perhaps in particular revolutionary societies need to sustain this mythology and in order to sustain that mythology you often have to view and tell and teach your history a certain way certain revolutions are not palatable and what Mm -hmm. ends up happening is when you contain and continue the story for a while eventually new generations will rebel against it um in the u.s you can sort of see this in the way um we are now fighting over what is the story of america and who gets to tell it 
you know, Hamilton mm-hmm. in some ways is, is, is an example of this recasting and revealing and re interpretation of the founding mythology of America. And, and so much of our political debates in the U.S. right now is over who gets the claim to be a core American and who gets to tell the American story um, mm-hmm. and, and, and who gets to now recover aspects of our history that we have not wanted to talk about very much. And what monuments do we want to topple? And what new monuments do we want to raise? Um, and I think how Jifang deals with this in, in, in the novel Under Mars. Uh, in order for Mars to sustain itself, it has to tell itself a certain story, or at least the older generation and those leaders um, and folks who are not rebels. Because, you know, I don't want to just make this about generations, because in the book it's very clear that many in the older generation do not agree with, with the official story. They, they, they see the necessity of some of it, but they don't agree with uh, continuous suppression. Um, the 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 need for achieving equality, for achieving a merit based society, meritocracy, for achieving um, freedom, all of these ideals which inspire young people of every generation to become revolutionaries necessitates questioning the founding foundational mythologies of their birth and of their youth, and they have to question the thing that they've been taught, the story that's been passed down, and, and try to discover, recover the past. Um, and I feel like um, Hao Jingfang is not explicitly saying this, but I think she's implying that this is, in fact, a necessity of revolutionary societies, that it is it is inevitable that to sustain a coherent narrative, suppression of history will have to happen. And it is also inevitable that the effort to do this kind of suppression will fail, ultimately and leading to a new wave of revolution. Yeah, got a, a, a wee anecdote of my own here again from a, a, non, a, a non-revolutionary a um, non country growing up in Scotland, going through the education system in, in primary five. So that would be like uh, fourth grade. Yes, yeah, so that would be American fourth grade. Um, we did the Scottish War of Independence, the one with William Wallace and Robert the Bruce, which the first half you can see in the film Braveheart, or you can see the Hollywood version of it. <laughs> right. It's not, I mean, there's parts that are really egregious. Other parts pretty much follow the real history. Um, But then we go to high school. Um, High school in Scotland starts when you're about, I guess it's the same time as America. The difference is we have no middle school. Um, So yeah, in second year of high school, so that would be aged like uh, 14, 15. 14? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, At which point history is still compulsory. You haven't chosen any of your subjects, Boom! One of the one of the history topics for that year was just the exact same thing again. Um, there is a lot of Scottish history. There are many wars against the English, but the one where we won was the one that came up again, and just literally a repeat of what happened in primary school. And then, if if you take history all the way to the last year of high school, up to age seventeen and eighteen, you actually can do it again. At least in the school I was at, you'd be doing Robert the Bruce again. To be fair, you'd be doing a nuanced angle. But you'd only be getting the most nuanced angle if you did the story for the third time. So I, I don't know exactly what they do down south of the border in England. Maybe there's more of a focus on imperial stuff, or maybe it's more of World War One and World War Two. Maybe that's the modern British foundational quote unquote myth of modern Britain, the, the World Wars. But just just mm. goes to show, I think this stuff, I'm sure whichever country, if I was from any other country, I'm sure there would be if I was being honest about the education system I'd been through. I'm sure there'd be another example of not necessarily omissions, but a mission by focusing on one thing that makes your country look cool or good or defined it's in a true. particular way. It's true. Yeah. And it's not just the, the level of nations. I mean, you know, foundational mythology is very important to all sorts of subnational identities too. I mean, mm. one of my favorite things as I travel around the US is to go to different state history museums and see how they tell this the the story of each you know, state. Um, mm-hmm. And it's fascinating to see what states try to focus on as they describe their own mythology and explain why, you know, they are the way they are. And and it's always um, interesting. I mean, for example, you go to Texas and, and you um, see how the 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 history of, of Texas, its founding as a republic, um, and its role in the Civil War plays such important roles. And they're so controversial. Mm-hmm. Being, now it's being made more complicated um but this this kind of effort to tell a coherent story which requires suppressing certain facts that don't fit with that narrative um it's 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 a worldwide phenomenon it's, it's human nature um and, mm-hmm. and in some ways 
maybe it's actually required for any kind of functioning society. You, you cannot have a functioning society without some agreed upon narrative, even if the narrative necessarily has to be challenged from time to time and changed. Right. So continuing along this line, here's a carefully worded question. Uh, what do you think Vagabonds tells us about the domestic Chinese tells us about domestic Chinese politics and what can or cannot be said under the censorship regime. Right. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll preface my question, uh, my answer by saying that um, the these kind of questions are very difficult for me to answer, largely because. Mm-hmm. I make such a big point about respecting authorial intent, um, which also means that I'm not quite free to offer my own interpretations because when I do offer my own interpretations, there is a huge risk of um, those who listen attributing these opinions as being informed by authorial intent um, and or that I've had permission to uh, make explicit certain things that authors left um, ambivalent or unclear in their fiction. Um, The way censorship works in China is such that authors and readers have gotten very good at reading between the lines and writing between the lines. And so often what isn't said is just as important as what is said. And you authors know how to say certain things um, to to express their frustration or critique or um, their um, fundamental doubt about the system. Um, without triggering the kind of uh, crackdown uh, that would make things difficult. Over mm-hmm. time, of course, the amount of freedom given to authors to even do this sort of thing um, had waxes and wanes. And right now it's in one of those stages where it's shrinking drastically. Right. So when if I speak very candidly and openly about speculating about all the um, ways that I think these are comments on domestic um, politics, um, what I'm doing actually is um, putting the authors themselves at risk um, without their permission. Uh, and I, I think, you know, as an author, uh, sorry, as an author myself, I mean, as a translator, I have to really uh, take very seriously the idea that you cannot do harm to the people you're trying to help. And you are not allowed to um, take risks with other people's lives. Um, so with all of that said, um, what I'm going to say is, the following. Um, Thank you very much for that preface by the weekend. Very well said. Thank you. Um, What I will say is the following. I think the novel can be read and um, readers are free to read it as a critique of many aspects of uh, the current system in China. Um, Whether those are intended by the author is obviously not going to be clarified. And, And if readers wish to read them that way, that is up to the reader. Um, I will also say that if you view this book as solely a book um, about protests against the current Chinese regime, you're missing out on a lot of what the novel actually has to offer. Um, I, I think the novel really is aimed uh, to be timeless and, um, and and it's ambitious. It is not a novel aimed at satirizing or ridiculing just some aspect of the present, a very narrow aspect of the present. It's, it's meant to say something much deeper about human nature and all political entities. Um, having said all of that, I think one of the ways that's particularly interesting to me um, and which readers may not necessarily pick up immediately is the idea of new generations inheriting revolutionary legacies and their relationship to the ideals of those revolutionary regimes. So. Mars started out as a revolutionary, idealistic, utopian society. Mm-hmm. The teenagers of our book, um, who are third, fourth, fifth generation uh, down from those founding members of the polity, find a complicated relationship to those ideals. When they learn about why the founders of, of, the, of, of Mars City rebelled against Earth and what they were fighting for, what is their relationship to those ideals? You know, readers should ask themselves, you know, how do they how do they view their own relations with those ideals? Later on, you know, there's this entire discussion about how meritocracy, freedom, and equality are all inspiring ideals with mm-hmm. abstractions. And, and they often come into conflict when you're trying to implement them. And so 
the, 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 the idea of young people who are yearning for something to throw themselves into, yearning for a revolutionary project to throw themselves into, and how they feel what they do is connected to the founding generation, to me, is a key thing. Um, mm -hmm. What I mean is, you know, if you study contemporary Chinese domestic politics, I think one of the most important things that that is there, but perhaps isn't talked about as often, is the state has fundamentally given up on its revolutionary roots. Um, in, in some right. ways, that's one of the things that's just least appreciated about the contemporary Chinese state. Um, this is a state founded on a radical Marxist ideology. More radical than the Soviet of, Union, right? Yes, of utter abolishment of private property, of complete repudiation of Chinese traditions. It is a mm -hmm. Western imported model uh, of, of enlightenment inspired rationalism imposed um, on a society leading to many tragedies and, and massacres um, and, mm -hmm. and great human tragedy. But people have to remember the, the founding members or a large portion of them and many of the young folks who joined the revolution were idealists. They joined mm -hmm. the revolution because they believed they were trying to found a utopia. They were rebelling against colonial domination. They were rebelling against the traditional um, uh, in, imperial and corrupt Republican regime um, that they yeah. were overthrowing. You know, this is and a regime I, that yeah. killed. I'd ref many refer people. my refer my listeners back here to the episodes we did on Lushun, two episodes on Lushun and one on Dingling, uh, both kind of idealists in, of the mold you're describing. Sorry to interrupt there. but No, um, no, that, that's, yeah. that's a very good point. Um, and, and so they were, you know, corresponding, to, they, they, would, they could correspond to the Martian founding generation. But today's China has repudiated essentially all those ideals. It's turning to this hyper capitalist state sanctioned capitalism mm -hmm. society um and uh, so what, what how are the young people supposed to relate themselves to the founding generation you know they, they live in a country that's founded upon revolutionary ideals none of which is actually um even respected as real anymore you know this is right. a this is a country in which folks are, are are pursuing wealth and trying to become influential by pursuing capitalist modes um yep. equality and meritocracy and freedom, which are the very ideals of the original communist revolution, have been shunted aside. So mm -hmm. I, I think I think one way to read this is to think about what does it mean to be a young person in China and who is idealistic and who believes in the ideals of the founding generation and who sees them as being corrupted and ignored and disregarded by modernity, by the current regime. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that means to them. Um, it does not necessarily mean seeking a Western-style democracy. I think that's actually something that's very important. Um, for folks who are idealistic, um, that may not necessarily actually be the model they want to pursue. Um, no. uh, they may not believe that Western-style democracy leads to freedoms and equality and meritocracy. In fact, many of us in the West question whether our current system um, is even democratic uh, as a result of, of heavy influence of you know power groups. Uh, yeah, in inherited action. wealth, private schools. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. So so think about that uh, and think about how it could relate to domestic Chinese politics. I think that's a much more fruitful way of thinking about it. Um, and, mm. and and what these young people who are rebelling um, really represent and what they're yeah. saying. It's a great answer, really, really great answer. Um, you reminded me of one uh, one thing I kind of noticed, whether it be reading upon China's revolutionary past and the government as it is now, or talking with uh, the people who I was around when I was living in China, for, for both within the, the government and in society, the idea of like generations is one of the main lenses through which to view things, the difference in generations is really striking, just like it is in Vagabonds. So that's one thing. Yes. And the other thing is another funny wee anecdote. So I remember not just in Shanghai, uh, all over China, but I remember a lot in Shanghai, maybe because of the years I was living there, um, you'd see the key, I guess, Xi Jinping's key words dotted around 
a lot of posters all over the city, and they're all great high ideals. Uh, Wen Ming uh, civilization is one of them, but the two that maybe for like a uninitiated Westerner that seem the strangest are, um, uh, if I remember right, Minju democracy and Suyo freedom, yeah. which um, you know re reflects on everything you were saying about high ideals maybe being cast by the wayside. But the funny wee anecdote here, and it'll be extra fun for anyone. Uh, living in Shanghai because you can try and seek out this location. Um, I remember one day I was exploring the city and I wanted to find one particular cafe because I'd fixated on it. It was all the way out west, further west than Hongqiao Airport. I uh, don't remember the name of the park, I can maybe try and find it later. But there was a little sign outside the park which was, it was one of the Xi Jinping or government keywords uh, with a little cute illustration, uh, the Chinese characters, the pinyin a paragraph of Chinese explaining the concept, so like a very high-minded philosophical thing that you wouldn't you wouldn't see here in the UK, and then an English translation underneath it, and it was it was ziyo, it was freedom, it was like a particular definition of freedom, but it was maybe more like a Martian definition. It was the freedom to be relieved of particular burdens to then pursue your life and your career as you want to live it. So like a traditional right. communist or Marxist definition of freedom, which is a perfectly nice one. But you know, doesn't require votes or freedom of speech and so on. Right. It's it, it's very interesting to sort of think about this because freedom is such a core concept in the book too. And you know, Loeing sort of debates over different kinds of freedoms. You know, she she sort of talks about: Are you actually free if you are free to buy whatever you want and to say whatever you want, except no one's listening, and to um, mm -hmm. uh, to basically consume as freely as you like without any ability to change the fundamental nature of society, which is, you know, what life on Earth is like. Um, or are you free in the Martian way in which many things are constrained and you're assigned to do what you're supposed to do and um, you will never have ability to accumulate wealth and to uh, do the things that you can do very easily on, on, on Earth. Uh, but uh, people claim that they're free uh, because mm -hmm. there are certain things they can do. Um, and it sort of makes it very interesting for us to examine our own assumptions about freedom and then what it is, um, you know, what we really, we really mean by freedom. Um, I, I think sometimes that idea is sort of characterized as the difference between freedom from versus freedom to, and, and the idea right. is that somehow we, um, in you know, the U.S. as an example, we're all about freedom too, and and so you know, where everything we do is right, but. I, I, I'm not sure, you know, that kind of simplistic um, dismissal of, of criticisms of, of late capitalism should be sustained. I mean, um, there is an actual way in which people's lives are constrained and our potential limited and our ability to be free um, absolutely <laughs> infringed upon when we cannot be, quote unquote, free from the fear of, you know, dying and being without health care and being... Um, having our livelihoods taken away uh, the way uh, that many of us sort of live on a daily basis. Um, so it's, it, it, it's a difficult, it's a very, very difficult and interesting question. Um, and, um, um, and, and I think it's worth meditating on what the children in the books really mean, in, in the book really mean when they say they're pursuing freedom. Is it, is it the earth version of freedom they're pursuing or something more closer to what they think of as, as the kind of freedom that their revolutionary forebears were fighting. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in the British version of freedom, something like more than half of our parliament all have the same undergraduate degree, uh, politics, economics, and philosophy. And the amount of people, <laughs> you know, they're all the same person in a suit um, with different hair colors. So if that's freedom, that's nice. Glad to hear it. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, and I remember in, in not not trying to get too distracted here, but in I did SQA higher politics, so like the end of Scottish high school, I took the politics module, and we got the stats for the like uh, various statistical statistical breakdowns of the UK Parliament in different eras, and it used to be more working class than it is um, because of the labour unions being attached to the Labour Party. But maybe just also that society was more equal then. So I don't know how much Vagabonds explores this, but the idea that society might become more fair or more free over time is actively disproved by these stats because the number, the ratio of working class people in the British Parliament is way down. And the number of people who all have the same undergraduate degree has risen and risen and risen. It's like we said earlier, it, it's a crazy world. Um, 
But before I give you another softball to analyze the book with and go off all down all these different alleys, just looking at the time, I think we should march on and look at some translation questions. Uh, about sure, the let's uh, let's finish that up. Yeah, because we could um, we could honest I could talk all night about this book, but we can't. That would be crazy. So uh, first question I've got about translation is from a show. He's actually a former show guest. He was my guest on the uh, the Otsushin episode we did on the story uh, Devourer. So it's from Adam McMurchy, who's a fellow Dundonian. He's from the same hometown I'm from. And nice. this is a question about a uh, process rather than language. So how you go about translation or how you go about your your task. So he wants to know like what tools you use. I'm guessing that means software. It could mean physical things, hardware as well. Um, so what tools you use and what methods you go about doing it. And I know, I know, I don't remember which episode it was, but I listened to a podcast you were a guest on where you talked about how you write and the software you use, and it was very interesting. So I'm expecting you've got a cool, maybe cool's a bit too loaded. I'm expecting you've got a, you have an answer. For Adam and Marchi here. It, it, it actually isn't going to be that cool or exciting, oh. but I, I will attempt to answer it. Um, okay. It, I, I, I've done all sorts of different things. I think the most important part of translation is just to make sure that you can. Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll talk about process. I think the most important part of translation really is, um, for me anyway, is to actually read the work um, over multiple times to actually absorb the author's voice and the right. author's intention because. It's very hard to figure out what translation voice to use until you've actually absorbed it and, and figured out the little tricks that the author has put in to do callbacks and echoes and so on and so forth. And once mm -hmm. I've done that a multiple time, uh, a few times, um, I go through a fairly mechanical process of creating a glossary for neologisms that the author has created um, and, and mm -hmm. other things like that so that I can translate them consistently. So, for example, right. because um, I know that the book is deeply influenced by Greek philosophy and you're so, uh, you know, take so many images and make so many references to classical um, Greek civilization. Um, I had to translate the legislature of the city as as bull, uh, the Greek. Oh term. yeah. Uh, now this is so, a, hand, a handy thing when I was reading this on the Kindle. Even without Wi-Fi turned on, I could highlight words and it would give me a definition. And I did bull was one of the words, but there were other Greek words. So I was like, what is this? Kindle, save me! And the Kindle gave me the word, and it would always say, as far as I remember, this word is from Greek society. Da -da -da -da. Exactly. So I, I, I could decide on things like that, which I think are very important um, to, to give the work a consistency, um, you know, as closely approaching the author's intent as possible. Um, so that's one step. Another step I do is I go through the entire thing and then pull out quotes and references and allusions. Um, mm. And then I have to go look up the original because, you know, what you don't want to do is to take um, a quote that's from English translating to Chinese and then back translating to English. Obviously, you want to find the original English in that case. Right. And in cases of translation from other languages, you want to verify them and then try to find the authoritative English translation that exists or you know, do your own translation, but it does not. I've actually ended up having to do that because um, it turns out that, you know, Jing Fang being um, the erudite person that she is, quotes extensively from British philosophers, from American economists, from um, French and Russian and German philosophers all the time. So I have to actually get all these quotes down and then look up where um, the original is and if there exists an authoritative English translation. Um, and of course, there are cases where she invents fictional quotes. And I have to, of course, find those and verify with her that they are, in fact, fictional. So mm. that step also, you have to go through to pull out all the quotes and allusions and, and verify with the author whether they are real or, or they're fictional and therefore can be retained as is. Um, by the way, this is fascinating. Um, so one of the book uh, books that she quotes from uh, or re references extensively is um, Wind, Sand, and Stars uh, by Antoine Saint-Exupéry. And right. uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful book, uh, but as it turns out, the French version and the English version are very different. Uh, the English version uh, omits certain chapters and includes other material that's, um, that's very different from the French original. Uh, I'm not sure how many people actually know that. Uh, it was news to me, uh, but apparently mm -hmm. Antoine uh, wanted the English version to be very different, and so mm -hmm. he made it that way. But the version that uh, Jing Fang quotes from is the French version. So 
uh, as it turns out, there exists no English translation of it. So I had to mm. end up finding the French original and then do my own translation of it. So that was very nice, very amusing. My little um, uh, debut as a French to English translator. Yeah. How, um, how is your French? Terrible, but uh, <laughs> uh, good enough to read uh, French philosophers, which is what I did um, with my French knowledge. Um, right. So anyway, so it was perfect. Um, I could actually do this part. So that that that's the other part. You go through the whole thing and then you pull out quotes. Um, and, and then I think I do one more pass uh, in which the task is. Uh, oh, actually, she also has some some Greek quotations, which um, I uh, could not do myself and had to go consult experts on what to do. Uh, anyway, very interesting right. stuff. Um, so once I've done all of that, uh, the next step is to um, uh, start actually doing the translation. And for that step, I just uh, put the documents up side by side, the working draft and the original um, on the same screen. Um, I tend to do a lot of my work on the iPad um, mm. and, or on a, on a Google Chromebook. So I would just try to use software that's effective for presenting the text um, side by side. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's not very sophisticated. Um, I'm, for translation work, I don't have to do a lot other than the ability to do global search and replace and to be able to um, easily jump between different sections. Um, so that's that's what I did. Right. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much how I approach it. Um, nothing fancy. Okay, cool. Um, another question from another uh, listener of the show. He's an interesting fellow. He's Stefan... Uh, my knowledge of Bulgarian names is not great, so I'm going to read this with my English language uh, tongue or brain. Stefan Rusino, and he's working on a Bul Bulgarian translation of a uh, three-body problem. It's his own initiative, apparently, but he, he secured the translation rights for it. So um, this is maybe more of a general question than a vagabond's question, given the, the, the context of you guys both being translators of uh, Santi, three-body problem. Stefan wants to know about just it's a very open question just about the bigger changes you make in your translations and he said the what the why and the how right so this is it's actually a much harder question to answer than people may think um mm -hmm. so I, I often get asked this question of you know how much do you change and what do you change in your translation and and i say well the i have to clarify with you that the premise of the question may be a little bit flawed if you don't do translations. I mean, in this case, obviously, um, Stefan knows what he's talking about, but but for people right. who don't, uh, I'll try to clarify. Um, the glib answer to a question like, what do you change or how much do you change when you translate is everything and nothing, uh, except there's a lot of truth to that glib answer as well. Um, it's everything because well, you're changing from one language to the other. So of course, everything is different. Um, and nothing um, in the sense that um, when you say something has been changed from the original, you're implying that the translator has deviated from some ideal, from some perfectly um, accurate, quote unquote, version of translation. When you deviate from that, you're making a change. But the reality is there is no such thing as that perfectly ideal baseline to, mm. to deviate from. Um, when you when you do literary translation, you realize that in fact every single word and every single sentence and every single paragraph may be translated in countless different ways, all of which are faithful and all of which are unfaithful in varying degrees. There is actually no single way that is quote unquote most faithful or mm -hmm. perfectly accurate because um, uh, because your role and your your approach and your stance towards the text and what you're trying to achieve um, all alter the approach you're trying to do. So the way I go about making changes, quote unquote, is the following. Um, I try to reconcile between two goals that I'm trying to pursue as a translator. The first goal I'm trying to pursue is fidelity to authorial intention. Um, I, I know that not all translators do this, but to me, it's, it's a super important ethical part of translation. Um, mm -hmm. As an author myself, um, I have a deep appreciation for how attached authors are to their creations. And, and because I'm translating friends and I'm trying to help them, I view my primary duty as not to the readers and not to some abstract idea of translation, but to the author herself. And so mm -hmm. it's extremely important to me that I understand what the author is trying to do, how explicit does she want to be with each 
thing that she's trying to do. How how convoluted and how much trouble does does she want the reader to go through to understand something? And how important is a particular word or idea to her that she wants it to be preserved、um, as much as possible in favor of other ways of translating that may be more faithful? So, for example, there may be a very literal and perfectly simple, straightforward to translate something that would, in a different context. Because you know English readers don't have access to the same information as the Chinese reader, not give, in my view, the same idea as、yep. as what the author is trying to convey. In that case, I will alter the words by not doing a literal translation and and try to convey the idea that she's trying to do. I mean,、um, one of the things that I think readers of your, I'm sorry, listeners of your podcast probably already know, but maybe not necessarily known to everybody else, is that in some ways, a writer in contemporary Chinese. Has access to a wider range of cultural and symbolic references than a writer working with only mainstream American audiences. What I mean is the following:、mm-hmm. to be an educated modern Chinese reader requires you to be proficient not just with classical Chinese allusions and all the literary conventions and techniques. From traditional as well as modern vernacular Chinese literature, you also have to be very Conversant with European history, European classical、uh, civilization, Greek、um, philosophy, uh, um, uh, contemporary American pop culture, Japanese and Korean contemporary、uh, pop culture, European shows.、Um, you you actually have to be familiar with all of this stuff. So as a writer, you can count on the readership. That is as familiar with Seinfeld jokes as they are with quotations from, you know, records of the Grand Historian. So you can do that. You can you can you can make references, and there are authors like Ma Boyong who does this all the time, who make unexpected comparisons between modern American pop culture and some classical Chinese、um, uh, aspect of thing, and it's incredibly. Funny, interesting, and, and all sorts of、um, uh, sophisticated. You know, just it makes your head explode.、Um, How Jing Fang does something similar. She she makes a lot of references to、uh, a very wide range of cultural references. The the European and Western stuff is easy. You know, most of the readers, her readers in English, would be expected to know these,、um, if not all of them. But she also makes so, some references to classical Chinese stuff. Um, that her original readers would know, but her new readers would not. And so,、right. you know, I have to make decisions about whether to change these or to explain them or to do whatever else needs to be done to make it work.、Um, it's 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 always a tricky thing to do. So, as I was saying, you know, one of my primary goals is to respect authorial intent. So I try very hard to do that. The other thing that I try to do is to try to translate as much as possible from a post-colonialist, decolonized. Um, stance um, and and to readers who question whether the the that sort of thing is important. Well, it actually is.、Um, you know, as 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 readers probably as as folks probably remember, it's a big deal when、um, Homer is translated for the first time by a woman translator、um, into English.、Um, it's a big deal because depending on the political. Approach and and the, the the sort of stance as an interpreter that the translator brings to the text. Lots of things that seem to be unquestionable or to be assumed to be true are changed. This is why translations of the classics change generation from generation. You know, you read a translation of Homer from the nineteenth century or eighteenth century or earlier, and it's very different from a modern translation.、Um, mm. And Not、yeah. because the original change; it's because the translator's stance and the, what the translator is trying to do has changed. And so, when I try to translate my authors, I try to take a very post-colonial, colonial, decolonized approach. What I mean is, there are still translators from、uh, a language like Chinese into English who take the stance that、um, you know China is a very backwards country.、Uh, Chinese authors don't really have anything. Uh, cosmopolitan or global to say they they belong to a very、uh, limited place.、Um, they 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 belong to、um, a literary tradition that's very、um, uh, poor compared to the West, and therefore authors writing in Chinese really can't say anything that's great.、Um, so I have to go in there, and、um, if I want these authors to succeed, I have to go polish them and make them more palatable for Western taste, and make them better, improve on them, if you will. Um, yeah, that kind of condescension 
um, um, is something that I push very hard against. Uh, and I, 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 I work very hard to not allow that kind of attitude to come in. So, so there are, you know, Western translators who often say, you know, the way Chinese authors write stuff is so rough, it's so, so, so non-graceful. Uh, I'm going to change it and so that it sounds better. Um, I, I try to resist those kind of impulses because um, I think there's a huge amount of beauty in the way modern Chinese has developed new ways of, of expressing itself and, and also um, just the rich variety of not just cultural references, but also stylistic approaches. Again, like we mentioned earlier, modern um, standard written Chinese includes a lot of techniques inherited from classical um, Chinese as well as Bai Huawen literature, but also tons of internet slang, a lot of net-based mm. talk, and a lot of translation needs approaches imported from um, Western languages or, or, or from Japanese. And it, it's it's very polyphonic um, and, and, and beautiful. Um, and different authors use these techniques to different degrees. And I think some of them, um, uh, when translated properly, uh, come across as very beautiful. And, and in fact, um, you know, if you're if you're a traditional translator, you often take the approach that the most important thing is to not offend your target readers. That is, you must make everything sound as natural as possible so that they feel like the translation was originally written in English. Mm -hmm. I don't take that approach because I'm a post-colonial, um, decolonized kind of uh, uh, approach. I have this approach to translation. I think sometimes one of the goals of translation actually is to stretch English a little bit, to allow English to do things it couldn't do before. So right. if mm. there's a way to do something that feels unnatural, but yet in another sense is super um, cool and a great way to actually show um, the novelty and the, 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 the precision and the beauty of the original, then I'm going to go take it. Um, in the same way that Milton felt perfectly fine to inject Latin grammar and Latin mm. techniques into English, I think it, it actually respects English and Chinese both more if you're willing to judiciously stretch English and make English do certain mm. things that it does not do normally and does not sound natural. I think that makes things better for both the translation and for the readers who are enjoying the experience. I'm not advocating you do a literal translation. As I mentioned earlier, I think literal translations are often exoticizing to be pointless uh, because right. they obscure the meaning. But I think mm -hmm. the pursuit of making translations sound perfectly natural is a fool's errand and, and possibly deeply condescending. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like... Um art house or arty cinema in a way that part of the value of it is that it, it's not a completely immersive experience it often calls attention to the fact you're watching a film so would you be in favor of a kind of translated chinese literature which calls attention to the fact that it is translated is that kind of attached to what you're saying or yeah, am i misunderstanding I don't, I don't, I don't, no i don't think you're misunderstanding I, I think i think that is certainly one way to understand it but caveat that with the idea that I'm not advocating that you take the approach of making everything as awkward sounding as possible. Yeah, that, no. That's not what I'm advocating. Um, what I'm saying, rather, is go read the translation of, say, Homer uh, or Ovid done by modern authors and see how much they, how often they say things in a way that is not what you would expect of a translation from classical Greek. Um, we have a certain mm -hmm. idea in our heads of how these translations in classical Greek and Latin ought to sound. And modern translations, when they're good and when they're beautiful, when they're done by translator poets, rarely sound like that. But at the same time, they don't sound like some 20-year-old teen, uh, young writer born and bred in America has composed a new work in perfectly innocuous American English. There are things about these translations that make it clear that they are, in fact, translations. Okay, right. so what I'm advocating um, is that that is what I'm doing. It, mm. it shouldn't sound like your traditional um, stereotyped translation from the Far East from the 19th century. That is not what I want at all. No. At the no. same time, I don't want you to make everything sound like they were written by an author who is has been who is just your typical quote-unquote American author writing a novel that happens to be set in China. I think both approaches are bad. You need to take an approach that combines or, or rejects both extremes and tries to give you something that actually stretches English a little bit and makes mm -hmm. it clear to the reader that this is a translation, but it's natural, it's beautiful, 
because it gives you a little echo of what it was like in the original Greek or Chinese.、Um, mm. I think that that is that is the ideal to strive. Well said.、Um, for anyone again who's listening, you you come to the show because Ken is here and you're interested in what he's been talking about. I've done two episodes on interesting. Modern or newer translations of Chinese、uh, literature. One, I forget. I, 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 yes, I think the one which came first was it was yet again. I'm bringing up Lu Xun. It was、uh, on Matt Turner's new translation of、uh, Ye Tao、uh, Weeds by Lu Xun, which he's called. Oh no, sorry. The original, the the first translation, which was done by、uh, Yang Xianyi and is it Grace Yang? I think they were working for a, a publication house. In China, in the People's Republic, their version was called Wild Grass. Editors note she was called Gladys Yang, not Grace Yang. And even just the title is interesting. Matt Turner called、uh-huh. it Weeds, and neither t- even both titles apply. And if you look at the two versions, they're very different. So that's one episode、yeah. that、um, illustrates kind of what Ken's saying. And another episode I did is on an even more peculiar or intriguing. Thing it's a Scots translation of Water Margin Shui Hu Juan by a guy called Brian Holton, who I'm hoping to have as a future guest on the show, and that's a rendering that seems to really capture the spirit of the original classical Chinese. But the version of English it's in is very different from any other translation you'll find. So two little episodes that yeah, it's pretty cool, and it's、um, that as as I talk about on that episode, that's up on a Scottish language corpus. It's like the first eleven. Eleven thousand words, I think. It's a big chunk. Op- the opening section of Water Margin is up there on in Scots.、Uh, even for me, it's challenging to read though because it's properly old Scots, which is maybe appropriate because the, the thing is from, or maybe it's not from classical Chinese. But anyway, it's an old text. Anyway, I have rambled far too much, so let's get on to the next set of questions.、Uh, these are about further reading, so I've got a little thing written here. I'll rattle it off.、Um, rather than looking at the different.、Uh, Other selves, the different language versions of Vagabonds. Let's look at its connections to other works, because it's like you've said, this book is full of references and quotes, and it's. I've written that it's trying to be part of at least one literary tradition. Maybe that's a bit of a bold claim, but it's certainly harkening back to lots of different things from all over the world. So this time, I'm going to play maybe a little bit of a game or take a different approach. I won't ask you a question. I'll just name the text, and then I'll ask you to riff on it. Are you Are you up for that? Ah,、uh, we can. Although I think some of these、um, we have already riffed on, but go for it. Yeah, let's yeah. I'm, I'm going to skip.、Um, I'm going to skip wind, sand, and stars because I think we've covered that one.、Um, the others, I think we could talk about a bit. So the first one is the the, the dispossessed, an ambiguous utopia by Ursula K. Le Guin, and maybe some of her other works too. How do you think that relates to vagabonds? Well, the dispossessed actually was、uh, the book that I used to explain vagabonds to、um, publishers and readers、uh, initially, because I think it's、mm. it's、uh, it's the most well known sort of Western analog to what Jing、uh, Fang is trying to do.、Um, mm. The dispossessed is, you know, it posits two planets, two two、uh, worlds.、Um, I guess it's not Earth and Mars, is it? I I think I might have said earlier in the show it was、uh, it, misremembered right, that. It's it's not Earth and Mars. It's a、uh, two two planets.、Um, well, not planet. One of them is the moon, and the other, but、uh, mm-hmm. sort of a double planet situation in which、um, one of them is a much smaller society founded by rebels and exiles from the other.、Um, and of course, the larger world is very hyper capitalist、um, and and very in some ways just a character. In some ways, I say a character of the world that we're familiar with. Um, mm. And the other is、uh, is an anarchist um, collectivist um,、uh, revolutionary society, and、uh, sort of the story is about a person traveling from one to the other and sort of learning more about both and, and the deep ambivalence、um, and ambiguity of, of both worlds.、Um, and I think you know it, it, it in a lot of ways captures the same kind of feeling that Vagabond、uh, gave me、uh, as I was reading it. Yeah. Amen to everything you just said. Let's speed on. So here's an author who actually came up in the episode with Shadja.、Um, it's not an author she'd referenced, but、um, it's an author who has a very quotable line about an eternal summer. Eternal, sorry, eternal summer. It's Albert Camus, 
and his work, The Rebel, or as it's referenced by its French title in Vagabonds, sorry if I tell me if I'm saying the French wrong, because I did German in school, not French. Lihom Revolt, Revolte. Close enough. Yeah, close enough. enough. Um, <laughs> right. that, that, not, that, not that I would do a lot better. My French right. teacher always um, got so upset when I tried to read aloud um, that, that she was just like, okay, stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, at least, at least she's honest. She's honest, yeah. So um, that, uh, The Rebel, is, um, you know, uh, very much a philosophical essay about revolutions and, and why mm. the um, and then what it is the rebels really do. And it's it's poetic. It's very beautiful. So much of Kimmel's writing is. Um, it, it flows. Uh, just every line is quotable. It's like one of those movies in which every shot is like some frameable picture. You know, every line is like quotable. It's beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it shows up again and again in, in, in this book. I mean, you know, in, in some, here, I'll explain something. And I think this will tell people whether they will like this book or not. If you're oh, yeah. the kind of reader who 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 hears that the main character of, of of this novel reads the rebel and is inspired by it and then comes back to it at crucial moments to quote from it time and again, and you find this incredibly moving and beautiful, then this is the novel for you. If you're the kind of author, uh, reader who hears that and says, "Oh, that sounds ludicrous and so." so not my thing and so over the top then this is not the book for you um so mm. that that's 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 actually a very good way to judge yeah well said that's a book that's one of the two books by Camus I read the other one's The Stranger and I read that living in China and it was it was it felt a little bit like it felt reading Vagabond where it was like oh gosh this is very poetic philosophical is this crossing any particular wine could I apply this to modern China Maybe, maybe not. It's yeah. more just stands as a piece of literature, <laughs> as a really thoughtful piece of literature. And yeah. like, it also is this is this a raise your fist leftist book? Kind of, kind of not. It I kind know. of just yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. But also, it just its own thing. Like he's he's a cool dude. I think he knew he was a cool dude. Next one. This is a a, a book, a nonfiction book by Hao Jingfang called, well, a translation of its name. In, into English would be time in Europe. The Chinese, if I've got this right, is Shuguang Li de Ojo. Yeah, that's right. So what's the, that one about? I believe that is a collection of memoir essays that uh, Zifan wrote about her travels in Europe, essentially, uh, her reflections on Europe, um, and of course related to, um, you know, identity as a Chinese person. I, I, I think um, it's, it's very natural to read this book and then sort of see that, see that some of Loin's ruminations on her time on Earth must be inspired in some way by her own experience. And I think that's perfectly fine if you want to read it that way. But, uh, but I, I think um, uh, it's, it's um, don't let that become sort of the determination for how you how you want to approach the book. It, mm -hmm. it certainly is um, one way that I think Jing Fang gets at the emotional truth of what it means to be a vagabond person. Um, because you know one of the things about vagabonds is, is it's it's a book about homeland and and what it means to have homeland. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to read from you. Um, this is actually a quote from uh, Wind, Sand, and Stars, but it appears in oh. Jing Fang's book as a core. Cool passage. Um, if the desert appears at first only as emptiness and silence, that is because it doesn't offer itself to inconstant lovers. A simple village in our homeland would hide itself from us in the same manner. If we do not renounce the rest of the world for its sake, if we do not enter its traditions, its customs, its rivalries, we cannot understand why it is someone's homeland. I think it's such an important passage because it really encapsulates so much about what it means to be patriotic, to to have a homeland, to identify with it. Mm. Um, this is not the blood and folk and earth and dirt and, and, and you know we got we got to kill the invaders version of, of nationalism, patriotism that gets um, slung around so much. This is something much simpler and much more basic. Um, it's it's that a people and 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 the land that they inhabit become. 
um, a, a cold, told story. In the same way that the landscape shapes the people, the people shape the landscape. And it is very hard sometimes for, for visitors to understand why a, 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 a landscape that otherwise appears as full of poverty or, or, or bleakness or some sort of thing that we, we don't identify as beautiful can be loved by the people who live there. Um, but it's very simple. Um, when you have a homeland, you renounce the world for its sake. Um, and you enter its traditions, its customs, its, its rivalries, and you become part of its story. Um, and Jing Fang's mm -hmm. novel is very much about Luo Ying's experience of, of first being having a homeland and then losing it and then rediscovering it again. And it's one of the most beautiful stories about what it means to love um, a people and a land that I've ever read. And and it's it's not about it's it's not about so much of the way modern um, nationalisms and modern um, chauvinism is, is manifested is, is, is this idea of hating someone else in order to show that you love your homeland. And this is not about that at all. Uh, and that's what makes it so beautiful. Loin does not hate Earth when she loves Mars again. Um, she, 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 she loves Mars precisely because she also loves Earth. Um, but she has to renounce it for a certain homeland. Uh, and that homeland may not be Mars. It, it, it may be something very different. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's what makes the whole thing so beautiful. It's about finding a homeland. Um, and, and the homeland may, in fact, not be uh, a traditional homeland. It may be something entirely different. Uh, right. for each of us to discover. Well, since you've mentioned deserts and questions of homeland, I kind of have to take this opportunity for, any again, anyone new to the show to just plug the previous episode we did, which was about the writer San Mao, who was mm -hmm. born in China, grew up in Taiwan, and is most famous for writing kind of like travel diaries from the Western Sahara, um, the old, which was a Spanish con colony at the time, adding another kind of level of questioning about the land and the people and the author's own homeland. I don't want to get lost down that tunnel, but again, just addressing the listeners, that's a fantastic episode with another awesome translator, Mike Fu. So I highly encourage it, uh, all of you to check it out. Yeah, some of books are very beautiful too. So if you mm -hmm. if you haven't read them, they are they're very cool. Absolutely. Um, let's go on to the next little name drop. Now I could be completely wrong about this one, but I'm fairly certain this is this was a direct. Not, I suppose, an indirect reference in the book, and it's Hamlet by some guy who I had to read a lot in school. I think he was called William. Yeah, some some guy who shakes a spear around or something like yeah. that. Him. Um, yeah. Him. Yeah. No. No. That's uh, that's definitely the case. Um, a lot of classical literature, but especially Hamlet, that that gets um, referenced. Uh, the hesitation, the the um, the whole idea um, mm. of, of yeah. existentialism. Hamlet is, you know, existential hero if you will. Mm -hmm. And Lo Loa Ying is, I guess, the main Hamlet character. She's, I think yes. there's literally some points where she's like, I can't decide. I'm just not sure. I don't. And she's like, well, should I act? Should I not act? And that's, that's Hamlet. That's right. Basically. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't spoil what the really specific reference in the plot is. But if you know Hamlet, I think you'll, you'll you guys will like it. It's, it's a good one. And it doesn't feel shoehorned in. It fits, it fits the story, I think. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And last name drop is one I've not prepared anything. I'm wondering if you'd like to point readers to any text that is related to or referenced by uh, Vagabonds. Um, I think uh, uh, not not directly. Um, I do think that it's uh, you, you'll get more out of the book if you know something about uh, Neil. Platonist philosophy and the whole notion of the one and so on, uh, because that comes up quite a bit um, in, in the book. Um, and mm. uh, she's she's very um, she she really um, goes very deep into it. And I think if you understand something about the 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 Neoplatonist idea of of beauty of the one of, of of its manifestation in this world of forms, you will have a different kind of appreciation for the book. Uh, I think you will appreciate more. Um, and of course, you know, if you if you have read uh, either the English or the French version of When Sent in the Stars, uh, I, I think you'll get a lot more out of this book as well. It's just a very, very important foundational text for, for a lot of what Lloyd has to say. Fantastic. Great answer. Great recommendation. Now, we're getting near the end. And at this point, I've got some more um, kind of fan questions for you. So questions listeners and fans of the show have passed on to or given to me to pass on to you now the first one 
we might skip over this one, to be honest, because as you've stressed, you are not the mastermind. You don't know everything. But one person is asking what's happening with the film of the three body problem and the Amazon TV series adaptation. Is this a question that is right to direct at you or is this asking the wrong I, I can't say much because, you know, what I know, I can't say and I don't know much. Um, so okay. I, I can't, um, can't really say anything. OK, right. Next question. Uh, th this is this is a very a very specific question to the three body problem. Um, it's about the wall face, and anyone who's not read three body or doesn't have it memorized off by heart, skip ahead about thirty seconds. And again, I don't know how much you'd have to say about this, but let's satisfy this listener. For the wall facer, Frederick Tyler, which version of his plan is your favorite? To turn the swarm fighters into quantum mirages or to use supermassive hydrogen bombs to attra attack the Trisolaran fleet with ice as bait? Is um, this I something mean, you have an opinion about? I, I, I don't have an opinion. I can, I can say something about it, which is, oh. you know, uh, this is, you know, wrote the new plan um, uh, for the English edition um, and... Mm. Um, you know, obviously the author did it for, for a reason. Um, I think we as readers are free to prefer one version over the other, um, but do know that the author, you know, did create the new version, and, and that is that that is what the author wanted to do for the English edition. Um, I personally like the original plan better just because it echoes what happens in Vault Lightning, um, and, and it makes a, a nice connection to the larger set of all his novels. Uh, mm. But it's it's not like I think the new version is somehow not good. Cool, thanks. So so for me, who's only I've I've read Three Body and I've heard about this. So the first option there, that's in the Chinese version, and the second is in the English. Is that right? That's right. Although I I have to also add the other point, which is many of the editorial changes that were made for the English publication of the Three Body series were then later on backported. Um, to use a software right. term, the Chinese edition. So I don't know if this particular plan was. I, my understanding is that it was not. Um, mm. So this this is a change that's only for the English edition. Okay. And the same guy, uh, I'm letting him get two questions through. He's assuming you know about these. So he's asking, what do you think of the Minecraft three body animations? But that kind of implies the question, have you heard about them? Yeah, I've seen them. Um, they're cool and they show how much fans love the work and that's pretty cool yeah i've not watched them yet i, I should get around to it. it it at least looks fascinating okay we have a question from a lady here she's asking i guess it, she hasn't specified the books so take this as you will which book she's talking about uh, what preparations did ken have to do before translating the books i guess she probably means three body and yeah oh, on, on the way oh, the next question is for me could you post a link to your podcast Yes, I will. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think I answered this earlier already. Um, mm. I mean, I, I, I said that I, I think, I don't know how many translators talk about this, but going through the whole thing multiple times in order to figure out a consistent glossary, and if you're working with co-translators, working with them to settle on a, you know, a glossary is important. And I think going through the whole thing to pull out quotes and references so you can look up the original and then do new translations um, or... Um, find someone who can fix your translation. Uh, in my case, I ended up actually approaching my French editor uh, mm. to, to help make sure that my translation is, is good. Um, that, that's also a step that's important. Um, and um, other than that, I, uh, I, I don't know how much preparation needs to be done. I mean, you can do all the preparation you can want and you're still gonna screw up. You know, I made mistakes um, just because there were slang terms that I didn't know and I mistranslated and then, um, if I'm lucky, um, the author or the beta reader would, would help me catch it and tell me, hey, you screwed up. Uh, and if I'm not lucky, it comes out and then uh, it becomes a, a little embarrassing incident where some reader writes to me and says, you screwed up, and then I go fix it. Um, mm. So you, you do the best you can, and uh, you're still going to screw up. And if it happens, it happens. You learn from it, and uh, you move on. Such is life. Amen. Uh, next question. This is from, it's a Mr. Zhu. I think this is a question from a guy who's uh, in the PRC and using a VPN to reach out to me. He's asking, what do you think about Chung Shin, the main character in Three Body Three? And a second question, again, how much you can answer this, I don't know, but is she widely discussed by English language readers? 
Um, well, I, I have to say that I don't particularly pay attention to what people say about books. I don't mm. pay attention to what people say about even my books, much less uh, one of the books I translated, because I feel like, you know, my job is to help the author and to craft the best version of the English um, rendition of, of her work uh, that I can. Um, and beyond that, how it gets received is entirely outside of my control and the author's control. And so worrying about it is pointless. Um, mm. But so I don't know what most readers say about Chen Xing. Um, I, I will say that I found her to be uh, a really uh, well done character and that the novel makes a big point about her. Oh, I, I, I will say that I did uh, get into one discussion where somebody apparently misread the book entirely and said that Chen Xing is supposed to represent liberal Western values. And the book makes it seem like liberal Western values always lead to terrible mistakes. Um, mm. And I have to say, whoever thought that must have been a terrible reader and, and have no reading comprehension. That's not what Three Body says about that at all. Um, if anything, Three, Three Body goes out of his way to say that um, Chen Xing made the right decision because um, uh, over and over again, we're told it, this is not her decision. We have to actually understand that the people chose her. And so the people made this decision. And it is the right decision. The book goes out its way to point this out, which is that sometimes survival is not the only thing that matters. And um, you have to understand that a value is worthwhile, not because it leads to victory, but because it is the right thing to do. Um, mm. Again and again, Chen Xing makes these decisions that are motivated by modern liberal values, and they lead to disasters. Um, that is not the reason to say, somehow renounce these values. The, the point is values are only worthwhile, and you only show your dedication to these values if you're able to hold on to them in spite of the fact that they don't always lead to victory. That's the important thing. Um, the universe isn't, quote unquote, fair just because you are a democracy and you are um, dedicated to freedom doesn't mean you're always going to win every war. Surely people understand that, right? Mm -hmm. That 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 you're dedicated to freedom and democracy and 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 living a life of of equality and pursuing those values, not because you're going to win against your enemies every time. If that's what you want, maybe this isn't for you. Maybe liberal values aren't for you. The the reason why you adopt these values is because they are the right thing to do. Um, mm. and, and, and sometimes you, you, you lose, even if you're trying to do the right thing. Surely we all know that good does not always triumph. Um, and <laughs> so that's kind of the point everybody's making. It's, it's that these are the right things to do. And, you know, sometimes you don't win. You, you don't win even if you do the right thing. Um, and, and for folks who criticize Chen Xing as somehow bad, then I think these are the people who think survival is the only value. And uh, I, I got hope. I, I hope that they're not the people in charge. Right. <laughs> well said. Um, yeah, you you were giving me flashbacks to just reading the last uh, of the Three Body Trilogy book, Death's End. If, if you really want some to be provoked to thinking, like, what is winning? What is surviving? That's an amazing... That book blows your mind multiple times. That's looking at those I'm kinds saying. of things. Right. I, I think readers who criticize her have just not understood the book or, or they, they, they have completely missed the point. Okay. I think you're probably right. Uh, last question here in this thread, and this is um, this is a completely different breed of question. Um, it's from Lance King Bluff, and I think he's he's referring to something called trisomy. I think that's probably referring to three body problem. So, assuming, <laughs> I think so. Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not sure what translation is that is, but I will respect it, and I'll assume it means three body. Um, so if you could write the ending of Three Body, what would you write? Would you wrote it the same way that Liu Cixin wrote it? Or would you go for another ending? And have you ever thought about writing a sequel to Three Body? And we can maybe inform Lance if he doesn't know about Redemption of Time here as well. Yeah, I, I feel like if you want a cool um, uh, sequel or paracol um, to the Three Body universe, uh, Bao Shu's Redemption of Time is the thing to go for i mean it's it's incredible um um no i'm not interested in i've never been interested in working um um in someone else's uh book because uh, uh, it's just not my thing uh the only media universe i ever participated in is star wars and that's because i grew up oh, yeah. in star wars then and um and i just couldn't uh 
to turn down the idea of writing for Star Wars. But other than that, um, I, I can't think of any um, other universe that I want to work in except the ones that I created myself. Mm -hmm. I did talk about the ending of Three Body as a whole on the episode with Shaja. Um, again, without spoiling what it is, the, ba the, the main thrust of it is movie as an adult, m movies have started to make me cry. Uh, as an adult, books don't get me, but there are exceptions. And there's something that happens at the end of Three Body, which you'd think out of all the book series you'd read, might being such hard sci-fi wouldn't be a tearjerker. And definitely, like, the thing that happens at the end, it is like a... It's something that touched me on... Like, it was a, an idea or a concept, not like a melodramatic scene. But I was like, damn. And it hit me, and it got the old waterworks going. So... Would it, I mean, if I was a writer, would I change that? No, because I don't think I could do it better than Leo Tsushin did it. It's a really interesting, powerful, mind-bending ending. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, that that final um, image is wonderful. Um, and and of course, you know, when, once you read the Redemption of Time, you have another layer of of, of interpretation, possible interpretation thrown in. So mm. it's it's just really cool to see the two writers uh, conversing uh, with one another um, in their yeah. works that way. That one is in my to-read list. Uh, pogging in yet another past episode, um, in that sci-fi series I did, the last entry was uh, Bao Shu's, um another time-based story. Why have I forgotten what it's... Oh, what has passed shall in kinder light appear? If yes. you guys have read Redemption of Time and you've read that story or you're interested in Bao Shu or just time, playing with time in sci-fi, just read the story and listen to the episode because you won't be disappointed. Right, I... I, I should mention that, you know, there's a tangential connection to Vagabonds, you know, which is a very philosophical mm. novel. Bao Shu actually majored in philosophy and is a philosopher. Um, right. And so his books tend to um, meditate around the concept of time in various ways. Um, mm. and, and so if you like philosophical fiction, Bao Shu is also interesting, but not philosophically in the same way Vagabonds is. Vagabonds is very philosophical and explicit. It's characters like talk to each sociological, other right? Right, right. Whereas, whereas Bao Shu often uh, is philosophy in the sense that he takes a philosophical idea and turns it into an interesting premise and then just runs a whole right. thought experiment on that premise. And it's fascinating, beautiful stuff. And I think I just interrupted you saying, uh, I apologize, that more of the philosophy is more in the character's dialogue in Vagabonds. Is that what I yeah, really interrupted? I, I, yeah, I think, I think Vagabonds is very explicit. You, you literally have these people going at each other making philosophy speeches. No, I, it's all interesting to me, but you know, I, I know that some, right, some readers really dislike that. Um, but but um, like you were saying earlier, I think um, Vagabonds comes in a tradition in which that sort of thing is, is, is a common technique. Um, mm, Greek philosophy. Familiar, right, if you're, <laughs> exactly. If you're familiar with something called Sophie's World, um, which I, think, <gasps> um, yes. I I think it's a beautiful book, and it is explicitly quoted um, in Vagabonds, and it is actually a very good analog to the style of Vagabonds. It's it's a very um, explicitly philosophical novel, if you will. Yes, I think when we were talking, I know I've honestly forgotten where. I'm not going to pretend I remember, but I almost brought it up earlier in the episode as like. I, no, I know what it was. So Sophie's World, I read at the end of high school when I was starting to read philosophical stuff. And it's a great intro to philosophy because, well, it's, it, I think the author actually wrote it. Uh, Justine Gar Garder wrote it, I think, as something he would read to a family member to introduce them to Western yes. philosophy. And that's what the book does. It's I believe it's right. Yeah, in I believe that, way. that's right. Yeah, there there are other books I read at that period which did similar things. I think one of them was Breakfast with Socrates, which is like one of these pop philosophy books that takes your daily routine and analyzes each segment by a different philosopher's ideas. Uh, but yeah, like if if you're starting to get interested in political philosophy, weirdly enough, Vagabonds is a great book for you. I think. Uh -huh. I think so too. I think it does a lot of interesting things, and I really, you know, I I, I really do think you. you, you if you approach it as, you know, a book that has a lot to say about political theory and political philosophy in general and, and how the world is, it's sort of between the way it is and the way it, could, it ought to be and the way it could be. Um, you know, if you approach it that way, uh, I think there's a lot of, a lot the book can offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't think I can pull any more questions out of the air apart from just to say, is there anything that we've not touched on but really should have that you'd like to mention now 
Um, no, that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I do want to remind the remind readers that you know when Jing Dong's talking about creativity and the importance of creativity, um, it's a it's a subject that she's personally very passionate about. So when her Martians are passionate about it. This this comes from something that's very deep um, in in all the other work that she's done. Um, mm. I, I can't emphasize enough uh, how much she's put herself into um, uh, creating viable creative education for children in rural parts of China who just don't have access to this sort of thing at all. And it's it's really important to to realize that this is not about you know. Pushing education in the sense of let's push some books and things for kids to memorize so they can take tests. That's not what this is about. She's pushing for、um, giving kids the tools to create their own worlds, to 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 trust their own ability to be creators.、Um, and that's something that isn't just relevant for China. My gosh, it's so relevant for the world as a whole for all of us. Um, and I feel like you know sometimes our public schools、um, don't have the room or or the ability to 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 emphasize this enough. But creativity truly is one of the most,、uh, if not the most important thing education ought to foster, and we just don't do to do it. Yeah, I during my education that's come a few times in the show、um, is in a state school, and it was there was a, a lot of emphasis on creativity. But that was before the era of like post two thousand and eight austerity, budget cuts hit us, and or just as I was coming to the end of school, that was just beginning to bite. And of course, the first things that get slashed are all these soft quote well quote unquote soft creative things. And that was me. Although it was a state school, it was a suburban area. It was mostly quite well off kids attending. And I can only imagine how much of a gulf separates me and well people all over the world, but especially the kids that. The kind of children and communities that Hajin Fang's、yeah. organization is trying to reach out to. So it's a great thing. Yeah, absolutely.、Mm-hmm. Yeah.、Um, one last question, and it's about you. Is there any of your own work or your own platforms or outlets that you'd like to plug and direct our listeners towards? Oh yeah. Well, it's、uh, the day we're doing the recording today,、uh, February twenty fifth, is、um, happens to be the publication date for my second collection of short stories,、um, "The Hidden Girl" and other stories.、Um, it's out from Head of Zeus in the UK and Simon Schuster in the US. So,、um, if you are curious about my own work,、um, that's a good place to start. That's really cool.、Um, I read your other collection, "The Paper Menagerie," and maybe some of our other listeners have. Is、uh, the hidden girl more of well? This make this is a. It's not the most positive phrase, but is it more of the same, or is it offering something a bit different? No, I totally get what you mean.、Um, <laughs> yeah, it's、uh, it, well, it's more of the same in the sense that they're all my stories.、Yeah. Um, so th- th- there will be thematic similarities.、Um, it's it's different in that、um, the paper menagerie was very much a book about. Um, it, it collected basically my stories that have been well received by some objective quote unquote measure. Meaning, it won some award, it was nominated for some award.、Uh, critics said nice things about it, etc.、Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, as as you know, based on my philosophy for doing anthologies, that happens to be not my preferred way to do collections at all.、Um, right. I, I I often don't agree with what other people treat as. <laughs> Awesome.、Um, I I have my own ideas about what is particularly interesting about my own work, in the same way that I think about other people's work. So、right. the hidden girl and other stories is is different in that it this time the 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 stories are picked by me, and I just picked the stories that I thought were interesting or showed、um, uh, delved into themes that I found to be particularly relevant.、Um, and so、um, I I expect this. Book will appeal to a different audience in the sense that、uh, some people who、um, uh, in that the stories in 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 this collection are more me in the sense that they're more、um, personal and they they often are done in a style that's more experimental and they often、uh, eschew sort of ideas um, about um, storytelling that many people accept but I I don't accept、uh, and so、right. it's. Quirky. It's going to be more weird. I guess is the best way I can put it.、Um, but if、right. you happen to resonate with my voice and the way that I do things, you're going to probably like this more than you like the Paper Menagerie. 
So could we say Paper Menagerie is like the Earth book, and this one, this uh, Hidden Girl, that's going to be like the Martian book. Wow, I like that. <laughs> you can I, have I, that for free. Wait, that is a nice way. I, I like your approach. Sure, we can go with that. Cool. Um, on that note, I think I should just say thank you so much for coming on the show. And for so long, this is going to be our longest episode uh, by a long way. And I'm sure the listeners will love it. So thank you for me. And I'm, I think on their behalf, thank you as well, I guess. Oh, it's been thank you, fantastic. Angus. Right. So thank you again to Ken Leo for that fantastic chat. I'm honestly over the moon to have had him on the show. That was a something I had like shower thoughts and daydreams about when I did the first tentative episode about um, Lushun's Diary of a Madman. By the way, how many times did I um, mention Lushun in this chat with Ken Leo? You could probably do a drinking game uh, if you wished podcast drinking games probably not the best variety of drinking game but it would work in this instance i think so anyway a reminder for all you guys that vagabonds is coming out in english in april the 14th of april and ken leo's the hidden girl his new collection of stories which as we <laughs> as with the conclusion we reached paper menagerie is the short stories that succeeded best according to like the law of the majority and market conditions and the hidden girl is stuff that's a little bit more particular, a little bit more personal, a little bit more artistic. That is now out. Kenley is probably working to promote it right now. And do him a favor, go buy a copy. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Yeah, so that's enough promo for him. Let's do some promo for me and myself and this podcast. So if you'd like to get in touch with the show, there are now lots of places you can do it. Uh, there's a Facebook discussion group and page. They're a little bit lifeless right now. I'm kind of waiting to see if they grow at all. But the best places you can go online, I would say, are Instagram and Twitter. My Twitter is mostly stuff about the podcast, the occasional more general thought. It's at Angus Likes Words. That's a great place to help, well, retweet the show, uh, get it out there, but also to have little quick exchanges with me or there's the dms if you want a proper talk uh, instagram is a really good place too the podcast has its own instagram account it's at churchific t-r-c-h-f-i-c um, i post news about the show i post pictures of books and things related to uh, upcoming episodes for example um dca um which is dundee's art house cinema has a little like art, art gallery uh, exhibition space i suppose and it just so happened that in the run-up to this episode, they had an exhibition on on uh, the left hand, well, well, on Ursula the Kayla Gwynn and the Left Hand of Darkness, and it just so happened in there they had lots of different tr- versions in translation of the books, book covers, and there was a ch- well, there was a Japanese, Korean, and Chinese as well as other European language editions. And my little photo of the uh, Chinese edition is up on the Instagram. So that's a you know that's not um, that's not an example of exciting news about the podcast. That's an example of one of the cool wee things I've put up there. But yeah, Instagram has cool wee things, it has cool news, and maybe best of all, it has group chats. Um, I've been taking advantage of Instagram's group chat feature to make a Sanmao group chat and a, uh, like a Chinese science fiction group chat. They've each got a few members, a few people who've had like a nice wee talk. I'm pretty much going to make a new one for every single episode that's upcoming and I'll um, put a little thing in the Instagram stories with a button you can click to join. Uh, those stories run out in one day but you can still be invited to the chat by anyone who's in them uh, myself included. So if you'd like to be in a Sanma group chat or a Chinese sci-fi group chat, uh, follow the podcast accounts on in- podcasts account on Instagram and ask and I'll put you in the group and you can say hi to all the um, enthusiasts who are in there already. Um, It would be nice to see those uh, being an ongoing thing and, of course, accumulating as I make more and more of these group chats. Just a nice wee thing and, you know, not behind a paywall. Speaking of things behind paywalls, (laughs) if you'd like to um, support the show materially, financially, um, you know, help me survive harsh market conditions, although we're not really in the market, but if you want to help me pay the hosting fees and give me a little something back for what I put in, there's two places you can do it. There's Patreon, which has several hours of bonus content you can listen to. Um, I do always intend to make more, time is always against me, so I haven't added anything up there recently. But the the intention is always to add things. But there are hours of uh, bonus shows and my thoughts and ramblings which are up there that you can access. 
um, by giving even just a dollar a month gets you access to all of it but you, there are other more generous options if you are a generous person and um, if you would rather give like a one-off a uh, contribution to the show uh, there's a uh, buy me a coffee which you know it, it's exactly what it sounds like you, you leave a little message and a one-off contribution rather than a monthly one that doesn't unlock bonus content but it does um, force me out of politeness and uh, the human, natural human emotion of gratitude to leave you a reply. So both those uh, places have very easy URLs. One is patreon.com slash truechific, which is T-R-C-H-F-I-C. Buy me a coffee is exactly the same. Buymeacoffee.com slash truechific, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. But here's something that is even better for the show than social media. It's telling people face to face, or it doesn't have to be face to face, but Word of mouth, spreading the word is the best thing you can do for the show in my humble opinion. So please do, tell your console, tell your comrades, tell the plucky band of teenagers that you went to an alien society with, tell your friends and family as well, that could be important too. But all in all, thanks for listening, really hope you enjoyed this episode, I'm sure you did, and until next time, Sai Chien. <laughs>